So thank you so much for coming to our ITS event. Um, I'm Tobias Schäfer from the College of Staten Island. I'm at CSI, I'm, I'm in mathematics and uh, at the Graduate Center, at the CUNY Graduate Center, I'm in the physics program. And um, well, thank you so much for being here. And also thank you so much, David, for co-organizing um, this event. Um, just a few words to get started. Um, um, for those who, who know me, I'm sort of working in partial differential equations, application to fiber optics, fluid dynamics, um, stochastic systems, rare events, and things like this. But about it's now 16 years ago, a friend of mine from graduate school, Dmitry Lesnik, got me thinking into about machine learning, and it actually really, really transformed my life. I mean, <laughs> really added a new dimension to 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 my research research perspective and um, these days I'm thinking a lot about artificial intelligence and uh, mark of random fields and uh, it's 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 yeah it, it really has sort of um, transformed a lot so um, I'm really excited about the speakers we have today and uh, I'm I'm sure whether you are already established in machine learning and data science, you'll learn a lot of new things or whether you're new to the field and you just want to learn a little bit more about this. I think it's going to be um, a fantastic day. And again, thank you, um, David. Thank you all of the speakers for joining us and thank you audience for joining us today. Um, Viviana, you, you have the floor for the first talk and we'll, we're going to learn about machine learning and the applications in uh, astrophysics. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Thanks Tobias and David for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And of course, thanks to everyone who has logged in. Um, I'll say the magic word of Zoom meetings. I will now share my screen and let's see. They should work, does it work? Yeah. So, and let me see, I'm gonna try and put the speaker gallery in a place so that I don't, um, you know, I can still see what my slides are. Yeah, so my goal is uh, um, to give a little overview of what we do with machine learning and astrophysics. I feel like, you know, it's a field in which like, like many in applied ML, you know, progress is very fast. And so I'm sure that, you know, these talks would be like, clearly outdated already, but I just, you know, like wanted to present a few of the applications that we've seen that have been developing very fast in the last five or 10 years. And again, my name is Viviana Coiviva. I'm a professor at City Tech, uh, one of the CUNY uh, colleges. I'm also the Graduate Center, and I'm a visiting scholar of the Center for Computational Astrophysics of the Flatiron Institute. And you have my email here in case you know you want to reach out about anything. So I'll say just a few words about me. I told you already about where I work. Uh, this is a word about where I'm from. I'm from a small town in Italy called Lecce. It's known for beautiful architecture. They call us the Florence of the South, but we actually resent this a little bit and we think you know, that they should be the Lecce of the North. We have beautiful beaches. We have a fantastic food. So why am I here? You're asking, you know, I've been asking myself similar things, but I'm quite happy, I have to say, been here for about 15 years. Uh, I always think of myself as an improbable astrophysicist in the sense that usually when you talk to people like me, they would tell you that, you know, like since they were like four years old, they would like, you know, go out with the telescope in their backyard. And I never put my eye on a telescope until, you know, I started doing a little bit of outreach, like, you know, fairly recently. In fact, I've embarrassing my, embarrassed myself many times by sort of just going to the wrong end. So, you know, I've struggle to accept uh, that you can be a scientist even without this sort of like consuming passions that you know about from when you're a child. And I think that's a good thing to know maybe, you know, like because I felt this was something that wasn't easy for me to accept. I also feel like that, you know, my whole career, I feel I'm constantly on the verge of quitting my job and doing something else. I've been saying this for years and years. I've been considering like 
a lot of different careers at the moment. I'm quite happy, but I'm still thinking that perhaps, you know, like in eight or 10 years time, I will want to go into real estate and maybe learn how to flip houses. And this is my current plan. So we will see. And finally, I'm also a mom. I have this beautiful five and a half year old. Her name is Clara. She's in kindergarten. She's getting her first COVID shot tomorrow. So I'm very excited about this particular um, aspect. And I'll tell you also a little bit about things that I've worked on. And the reason for this is just to show that uh, you know, often um, you will see people keeping working on the same topic over and over. And I found that in early stages of my career, the idea of like exploring different things, which was very appealing to me because I get bored quite easily, wasn't really encouraged. And I think it's true that, you know, it may be tricky, you know, often just to sort of like progress in an academic career, you are supposed to become the expert of something. But I also wanted to show that this is not always the case. So I started in my master's thesis, I work on, you know, like the very first few seconds of the universe, something called inflation. Uh, my PhD thesis was called weak lensing, gravitational lensing and cosmic acceleration. I work on modified theories of gravity and phenomenology for my first postdoc and cosmic microwave background. Then for my second postdoc, I did like what's, you know, in my field is a complete change. And I started looking at galaxies and studying their physical properties. And this is something that I continue to work on also now as faculty. I've been at CUNY, this is actually my 10th year, so quite a while now. Uh, and uh, in the last decade also, I started working on machine learning and data science and their application to astronomy and astrophysics. And in fact, I started learning about this just because I wanted to quit my job and go into industry. And then instead, the net effect was that I started using it in my research and that sort of rejuvenated my enthusiasm for the field. I also met a bunch of great students and I have to say, this is probably the main reason why I'm staying. And I've thought a lot, I think a lot about, you know, what, you know, what skills we should try to give to our young modern physicists uh, to prepare them for both academia and industry. And I want to say, I'm gonna, you know, start with the, you know, I guess the more topical part of the talk now, but I feel like, you know, we have um, not a huge audience. So I would say, you know, if you want to ask something, feel free to interrupt, raise your hand, maybe Tobias, you can keep an eye on this or on the chat, you know, I'm happy to just like stop and answer questions. We don't have to wait for the end. And I try not to pack too much so we have, you know, a lot of time just to discuss. So, you know, we hear so much about data science. What is data science? I thought, well, I don't know, let me Google it. And this actually, I have to admit, I Googled it a little while ago. And, you know, this is like the first image that pops up, that, you know, with some sort of like, you know, fancy intersections of different fields, machine learning, like computer science, math and statistics, and then domain slash business knowledge and blah, blah, blah. And I have to tell you, I don't believe in this, you know? So instead I feel like, okay, let's say that at some point you have like someone like a scientist and, you know, like they are looking at drawing from Galileo. This is actually from the Galilean Museum, Museum in Pisa, uh, you know, looking at phases of the moon. This data science, they know, and then maybe they come up with an idea. Is this data science? I would say yes. You know, every time that you use data to do science, this is data science. So, uh, you know, I feel like maybe a more relevant question is like, why are we hearing so much about this now? And I think the reason for that is that the science is the same, but the data part is changing. So I'll tell you about, you know, like the next big observatory for, oh, I'm sorry, for ground-based astrophysics is something called um, the Vera Rubin Observatory. And you may, may have heard about it. Uh, previously it was called LSST or Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And then, you know, they decided to rename it to honor Vera Rubin, who was one of the scientists who participated in the discovery of dark matter. Uh, and now, you know, they still keep the LSST acronym for Large Survey of Space and Time, which is also quite neat. And so this is um, a large facility, a telescope, uh, that has been built on Cerro Pachon in Chile. 
And, you know, unlike many of our Astro projects, this has been like amazingly on time. And so they are really, um, you know, supposed, you know, constructions is basically done and they're supposed to have like first light in 2023. So it is really close. And, you know, just on paper, if you think about, you know, what LSST will do in terms of, you know, data taking, that's impressive. So the goal is to have a catalog of about 37 billion objects. And in practice, when I say objects or sources, I'm talking about 20 billion galaxies and 17 billion stars. And now 20 billion galaxies is a sizable fraction, in fact, about 10% of all the galaxies that we believe exist in the universe. So, you know, like we're starting to really sample a sizable fraction of the observable universe. And they will be observed in six bands. And you can think of bands like filters. You know, you're familiar with RGB images, red, green, blue. So here we're just adding a little bit, you know, like maybe like one more filter on the ultraviolet size and one more filter on the near infrared side. And this will happen over 18,000 square degrees. Now, what does it mean? The entire sky, both hemispheres are 43,000 degrees. And so this means that you will observe almost half of the sky. And what you have here is a little plot that tells you about the attendu. I never know, I should really learn how to pronounce this word. But basically this is sort of like a proxy for um, the amount of data collected by a telescope, uh, let's say in the same time as others and roughly scales with the field of view which is you know just the area of the sky that is taken in one single observation times the size of a primary mirror telescopes are basically buckets to collect photons and so you know like the bigger the buckets the more photons you collect and this is actually a log plot that shows you how lsst is like you know an order of magnitude or more powerful than other surveys and, you know, just to tell you a little bit more about the data challenges uh, that this project comes with. Well, you know, one thing is, you know, also you are on the top of the mountain, right? So, you know, all the data needs to be streamed to the base of the mountain and then to the data processing center, which are mainly in North America. And this is already, you know, something that requires uh, a decent amount of bandwidth, you know, more than our usual needs. Then, you know, you have um, 11 projected data releases with the final, you know, set of images being equivalent to having five and a half million images and each one being 3.2 gigapixel. So it's big. And then again, this is like for the first data release, you observe, you expect to have about 18 billion objects uh, going to 37 billion in the 11th. But perhaps the most, you know, impressive number just you know as a standalone is the fact that each night there will be 30 terabytes of data that are collected and need to be streamed you know like along the sites and uh, on top of that uh, you expect to have about one to 10 million time domain events per night. Now, what are time domain events? You know, in astronomy, there are things that we observe as, you know, like galaxies and, you know, galaxies tend to be there where they are, you know, like when you go and observe them, doesn't matter. But you also have a lot of so-called transient events. And these are things that, for example, explode, you know, like a supernova or a gamma ray burst or a fast radio burst. These things are interesting, but if you miss them, they're gone. Typically, you know, like you need to follow up on that possible detection very quickly. And so the idea is that, you know, these few millions events need to be detected. So you need to, you know, figure out that something is happening that is unusual and then transmitted, like streamed away within 60 seconds. And so this is where the challenges come in. And just to give you an idea of, you know, how this compares to previous, um, you know, generations of observatories, uh, perhaps the most, you know, comparable and very successful survey that we had for a long time is something called SDSS, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It had many data releases. I picked the seventh because it came uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. And so, you know, we can take a look at can you still see my screen if I go to the browser? Yeah, okay. Uh, we can take a look 
at you know like the whole data release of the survey so you know there's about like 10 years in between so yeah data release 9 2012 you know perhaps 11 years at this point let me see if i can do this then here we go all right so in this case you know like we're looking at the data release 7 of the sdss and we can look at you know the uh, global volume of the data that are released and so the images are the ones that are biggest and that's about you know 16 terabytes of data and then spectroscopy is another bit and again the entire catalog the entire data volume is about another like four terabytes so basically you know like 10 years have passed and now um, you know the amount of data collected in one night surpasses the amount of data collected by this other survey in his entire data release. And I feel that this is why now you hear so much about data science, machine learning, what do we do? Not because the science really changed, but because the data uh, have changed a lot. So let me see if I can go back to my presentation. So, you know, I like to think about this as big data, but, you know, there are also other differences. One is what um, I heard called, this is actually not my uh, definition, wide data. For example, you know, we can look at the sky in, you know, like different wavelengths and they reveal different aspects of things. And so in a way, this is uh, not just bigger, but just, you know, like different angles or different aspects of the same objects. And then another thing that we are encountering more and more often is new data. And now this is an actual merger of galaxies that is known as the question mark system because it looks like a question mark, but it's actually real, it's two galaxies that are merging. And this is like tidal stripping from the gravity of this little one here. Um, but what happens is that when you start seeing just you know like such a sheer amount of data, you also find things that you didn't know existed. And so you need to come up with some sort of method or pipeline to make sure that you can actually recognize them and recognize that perhaps something interesting and unusual is happening and you know, flag them as an event. And this is another challenge that we have. And so to deal with this that I like to call rich data uh, is where machine learning tends to come in. Now, we said, what is data science? Uh, I guess we should answer something like, what is machine learning? And you, know, you can ask many people, they will all give you a different um, definition. But I think for me, I think about it as the art or maybe the process uh, of teaching a machine to make decisions. And I think um, you know, there are many complicated things that you can do. But I like to think about it in terms of, you know, what are the fundamental tasks where we can ask a machine to do? And to me, I think one possibility is recognizing things. Right? So we have here, you have like cats and dogs. And, you know, if you have seen some of them before, you can, you know, ask the machine to, you know, after being, after showing some examples to, you know, classify them as belonging to one or the other group. Another possibility is to predict something that is missing. Here, an example is like to complete this image. And of course, you know, you need to have seen other images of cats before. Uh, otherwise, it would be really hard. But if you have, then it's not so hard to complete. Or it could be predicting, you know, another property, another feature, another uh, important thing. Then you have group together. Uh, this is again done with cats and dogs. And in this case, you know, even if you haven't seen before examples of cats and dogs, you can just recognize things that are similar and you know, put them in a certain group. And sometimes we talk about this as clustering. And finally, we can ask to simplify. So if you were to ask the machine, you know, like what's the sort of like smallest amount of information that I can give you uh, to, for you to recognize this shape as a cat. So you know, if you have to reduce a cat to its quintessential you know, identity of catness, what's the simplest and smallest way to do that? And I think, you know, a lot of the things that we hear that, you know, like ML or AI can do, uh, can be expressed as some sort of like 
combination of these tasks. But of course, you know, we are mostly interested here in thinking about how about in astronomy? Uh, where is, you know, that we use these things? And so I think the first thing that we do that perhaps is, you know, it doesn't sound as exciting as others, but I think is very important is to save time. And one of the first applications that we had of machine learning to astrophysics was to recognize the so-called morphology of galaxies. So when you look at pictures of galaxies, you know, and this is something that Hubble already proposed almost a century ago, uh, you see that they tend to have different shapes and colors. So for example, spiral galaxies like this one, they tend to have like a brighter center area and then they have spiral arms and you know, they tend to have yellow, uh, white and blue colors because uh, there are young massive stars that tend to you know, overshine all the others. And then you also have elliptical galaxies like the one here. These are more red. Usually they don't have you know, like a lot of obvious structure other than like you know, being brighter in the center. And for humans, actually to look at this picture and recognize you know, what type of galaxies we're looking at, or even things that are really different from others, uh, is quite easy. But now, you know, think about what you have to do when you have millions, and in fact, as I've told you, billions of objects. You know, there's really uh, no amount of, you know, it's something that you just cannot do, you know, if let's say that, you know, like you are a researcher and you need to look at all of this. So one approach that actually has been really successful is so-called citizen science. And so that, you know, like rather than asking one student to look at a million objects, you can ask uh, a thousand people to look at a thousand objects. And then you actually, this works quite well because then, you know, if you stack the most popular opinion, uh, you tend to get an answer that is quite accurate. However, the numbers that we are getting into now make even this approach of sort of like, you know, distributed uh, classification uh, hard. And because of that, uh, you know, we've been starting to look at automatic classifications uh, using machine learning. So in this case, you know, you could do it in a supervised manner in which you uh, show the machine a whole bunch of images uh, together with the labels that may be like, you know, a trained uh, researcher has given, and then you can hope that the machine will understand what's the relationship between the shape seen in the image and, you know, the morphological classification associated to that. But you can also do it in an unsupervised manner uh, and just, you know, ask the machine to group together uh, objects that are similar. This, you know, is more difficult to do, uh, but also really interesting because, you know, every time that we humans decide, okay, you know, these are the three classes to which these galaxies belong. It's spiral, elliptical, and irregular, to say it with Hubble. You know, maybe this is not the best way of uh, creating groups for these galaxies. And so doing it without, you know, just saying, hey, put together the things that are similar and seeing what comes out is a way of sort of having a data-driven check-in that doesn't require astronomers to decide what's important. But overall, you know, here, we're not doing things better than humans. We're just doing things a lot faster. And this is, as I said, perhaps a bit less exciting, but I think very important. What else do you have? Another thing that we can try and do is to change the way that we do inference. Like let's say here, I'm looking at, this is a spectrum of a galaxy. Spectrum is just a chart of luminosity versus wavelength. And these are the things that we can observe. But you know, once we observe this, you know, we want to know something about the properties of the galaxy. Let's say, for example, mass. And typically, what we have to do is to write a complicated model. This is called the likelihood that says, okay, I'm going to choose which parameters are important to uh, generate a model spectrum. And then I'm going to compare the model that I have as a function of the parameter with the observation, and then, you know, like, 
come up with some sort of like, you know, fitness for the similarity, which could be like, you know, typically it's a chi square. And then I try to, uh, you know, use this likelihood concept to do some, to do classic inference on the parameters. And, you know, one of the parameters here will be the mass and that's how I answer this question. But as I said, this means that, you know, we are deciding that an object as complex as a galaxy will be described by, you know, a small amount of numbers, which are the parameters, and we are deciding what the parameters are, which, you know, is not bad because we're using some sort of, you know, physical intuition, uh, but also maybe not ideal because every time we make these choices, we introduce biases. And so we could do it in, I mean, I'm reluctant to say model independent way, but I would say <laughs> with, the mo with, you know, with different dependencies with machine learning. So in this case, what we can try and do is to uh, teach the machine to learn by example. Uh, let me explain this a little bit more. Let's say that, you know, again, I have a, some spectrum of a galaxy and I want to say, okay, what's the stellar mass? If, and this is a big if, uh, but, you know, if I have, let's say, some examples of galaxies uh, for which the stellar mass is known, then maybe I can get away with this likelihood approach and just tell my machine, hey, look at this. For this spectrum, the stellar mass is five, you know, 500 million times the mass of the sun. For this other one, uh, the mass is 6 billion times the mass of the sun. For this other one, the mass is 800 million times the mass of the sun. For this other one, this is like, you know, big one, 8 million times the mass of the sun. And then uh, you represent the first one, for which the answer was not known, and you ask your machine, hey, you know, based on these things that I've showed you, can you tell me what you think the mass of this galaxy will be? The machine, you know, will take a moment to think and, you know, come up with an answer. And this happens without writing a likelihood and, you know, without necessarily writing a model. The algorithm that you choose may still, you know, have a say, uh, about, you know, how the relationship between input and output is modeled. But this is like, you know, uh, doesn't require the same amount of likelihood and doesn't require the step of writing how your observable looks like as a function of the parameters, which is typically very complicated. So this is, you know, it's a, an alternative way uh, that can be very powerful, provided that, you know, you know the ground truth, the so-called ground truth, uh, for at least some objects, which as you can imagine in astronomy, it's not very easy because you know, <laughs> usually galaxies don't come with labels that say, hey, here is how many stars I have. And so, you know, like collecting these things is difficult. What else? Another thing that I find is really nice is, um, you, sorry. Uh, is to use higher level data products. So let's say, for example, you know, we work a lot with images. Right. And, you know, we're looking at a galaxy. Well, actually, this is another merger. There are like two galaxies close to each other. And then if I wanted to, sorry, my PowerPoint is uh, a little uh, iffy today. So if I want to do model based inference on this image, I would need to write down um, some sort of likelihood uh, of obtaining this model, given the image pixel by pixel. And this is like a very, very messy process. But in machine learning, I can use algorithms that are actually meant uh, to work with images. And so I can just feed them images as input. And I'm very upset because in PowerPoint, you cannot actually play GIFs, which I have spent a long time preparing. So I'm gonna just show you here that this GIF works. I've lost my zoom powers. Where are my zoom powers? Sorry about that. All right. Uh, point number four, something that I also like a lot. Well, uh, 
Machine learning, I think, helps us make some problems that were not tractable, more tractable. One powerful way of doing this is using dimensionality reduction. Right now, this is not a particularly impressive example of that, because you, know, you can see here, it just shows you some data that exists originally in a three-dimensional space. Uh, and you can see that you know, like there is some sort of sequence that suggests that the color is actually varying on a two-dimensional manifold. So this suggests that perhaps you know, like the uh, important dimensionality of this data is actually not 3D, but two. Uh, and this means that you, know, you could find an appropriate way of projecting your data down to two dimensions without uh, a lot of information loss. And so this shows you three possibilities. And you can see here that this one is not very good because you know, now all the colors are scrambled together. So I'm losing a lot of the original information, uh, but the bottom two are actually quite good. Now, going from three to two dimensions is not super exciting, but you know, a lot of our data live in a lot of dimensions. And you know, in many cases, we can actually um, reduce it down uh, significantly. Uh, and this makes you know, a lot of difference when you're thinking about even just storing the data, you know, even without thinking about doing science, but you know, like looking at these giant data volumes that we produce and understanding how we can store them. And another thing that I find quite interesting is um, something that I'll talk about a little bit later as well called domain adaptation or uh, knowledge transfer. So the idea here is that uh, maybe you have collected data uh, or you know, made experiments for a given domain. It could be simulations or it could be like just you know, a different service. And so there are ways in which you can sort of learn, uh, sorry, apply what you have learned to a different problem. So you can some sort of recycle uh, some of the data analysis that you've already done in order to either save time or be more accurate. And this works, for example, by learning and simulations and applying to data, but also simply you know, thinking about you know, all the time that we have spent, let's say, analyzing data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and saying, okay, what part of this pipeline can we recycle so that you know, when you know, the new data from LSST come in, uh, we are able to process them more efficiently. And my last bit is to learn more about data-driven representations. So again, I'm showing here the spectrum of a galaxy. Um, I don't know if you know how familiar you are with this, but here in the spectrum, the way that this has been built is by collecting a measurement of the brightness of this galaxy at every wavelength between 4,000 and 9,000 angstrom. So this is roughly uh, the optical and the near infrared just over to the right. And you know, it's a very detailed chart that has like, you know, lots of ups and downs. And you know, you can imagine that here you have some sort of like average luminosity, and then you see dips and spikes. Now, the natural representation that we have is a vector that say, you know, if we have a measurement for every angstrom, for example, it's a vector with 5,000 numbers. Right? But this is hardly ideal. Because in reality, when you think about, you know, like doing science with this, which means you want to learn something about this galaxy, then a lot of the information you're looking for will be, for example, in the intensity of the spikes that are actually emission line from particular items, atoms, or uh, it will be the gradient of the entire spectrum that tells you about, you know, how much, uh, how many stars the galaxy is forming at a given time, and so on. So you can use a lot of these machine learning tools to uh, you know, improve your results, because in many times, having a better representation will improve the accuracy of your output. To develop new intuition, let's say that, you know, for example, you discover that there's a part of a spectrum that you didn't think would contribute much to you know, inferring a certain quantity, for example, mass, but it turns out it does. Now you can use this as an idea of like, okay, why is this happening? And uh, you know, it, does this teach me something about physics that I didn't know before? And then finally, for this sort of, you know, again, humble, but I think very important point of just obtaining an efficient representation uh, that is smaller 
which means now you know we can store a lot more data and we can also make it more accessible because this is the other thing you know perhaps giant facilities have a way of storing all this data but if you put yourself in the shoes of you know an early career researcher who's working with their laptop and they want to access this data because you know one thing that is nice in astronomy is that most data are public and process them in their laptop then you know like you know 30 terabytes per night uh, is not going to be useful so finding ways of you know like providing data products that are rich in information but more manageable is also super important just as a way of uh, improving or just keeping the same level of accessibility to everybody um sorry this is me messing with powerpoint um so i wanted to talk a little bit of state of the art you know what is that we see nowadays in astronomy and machine learning and i think the main answer is a lot of deep learning and deep learning i'm sure you've all heard about it is any process in which um as we say we have an input we have an output something that we want to predict and rather than going at it with just one step we have sort of like multiple stacking stages so that the input of one layer the output of the first layer becomes the input for the next one so rather than having one model you know the idea is really not so revolutionary just that the architecture is optimized for this but the idea is that you become more powerful to represent a relationship that can be very complicated if rather than just doing in one step you do it in several steps and so this is output of layer one becomes input of layer two and so on until your output is here why is this so popular well i guess that the reason is that it works really well so you know not particularly profound but we found that there are a lot of deep learning algorithms that are very um powerful to solve the problems that we have. So perhaps the most popular until now has been convolutional neural networks. Uh, what do they do? Well, they are especially optimized to process images. And you know, as you can imagine, in astronomy, we have a lot of images as inputs. You know, we want to analyze images. So having a way in which you know, we don't need to do any data reduction process, but we can actually act on this input is super helpful. So in convolutional neural network, you basically have like two steps in this machine. The first part takes, analyzes different pieces of the image to figure out what are the features that are most important, creating these so-called feature maps. So this means that, you know, you can see that we start with one image, and now we have several, um, how to call it, several representations of the same image. And this means that in each of them, we're trying to emphasize one type of feature. It could be edges, um, it could be curves, it could be contrast. You know, For every image, you're able to figure out what are the things that are most important. But the idea is that you come up with multiple representation of the same image that are trying to isolate the features that are most important, going from small scales to large scales. So now you're able to explore small scale correlations and large scale correlation. Like this is like an image in which, you know, what matters is the fact that it's a street sign and the number that is inside. Right, And so you, to recognize the number six, you'll need to look at things on the smaller scale, but to recognize that this is a sign, a street sign, you will want to recognize this larger scale, like, you know, like the shape and the contrast of these colors. So the whole first bit of this is just something that creates a better representation uh, of your image. And so this is a feature extraction or feature generation process. And then basically the output of this is used as an input for now if you want to even you know you can put here any traditional machine learning algorithm that could act to tell you okay what is that i'm looking at so a pure classifier and so you know this is again a very um incomplete list but no, sorry but convolutional neural network have become 
really popular in astronomy for this reason. And this is one example that I really like to give you an idea of why uh, they're helpful. This is a software called Length Flow, uh, and it's used to recognize strong gravitational lensing. So what happens here when you look at galaxies uh, or clusters, but I think here it's galaxies, uh, and there are galaxies behind them, then uh, the light from the background source is distorted because of this large mass that is in front, the curves of space time. And so it tends to appear in the image as arcs. You know, ideally you will have like, you know, if there was perfect alignment, you may have actually a perfect circle, but this is almost always not the case. And so instead you tend to see these arcs. And this is really nice because these lenses are actually magnifiers. And so the background source that normally is too faint to be seen because it's too far away, now it's actually seen in this magnification process. And convolutional neural network, as I said, because they are really trained or they can be trained to look for these shapes, like something in the center and then, you know, like arcs around it, uh, just makes this process more efficient and faster. Uh, another one that is really fun is generative adversarial networks. So rather than having, you know, you can build this with different architecture, but the main idea here is that you have two networks that are competing with each other. So uh, the, there is a generator that wants to try and build images that are fake. In fact, the generator never seen even real images, but it's trying to learn to make images that while being fake, they're actually so similar to the real ones that they cannot be distinguished anymore. And he's competing with the discriminator who's there to say whether an image is real or fake. And so the goal here is really to be able to beat the discriminator. This actually, you know, it came, you know, it was born as a fraud detection algorithm. But for us, it's really super fun because it means that we learn how to make real looking images. And not just real looking, you know, in terms of, okay, there is one single image that could pass for a real galaxy or star or whatever, but also, you know, to respect all the statistical properties of ensembles. And because making simulations, you know, like of the universe is very expensive because the universe is very big, being able to come up with you know, a way to enhance the ones that we have is really nice. So this is, these are two examples of application of these GANs or generative adversarial networks uh, to astronomy. One is basically to improve the resolution of an image using the fact that you know how real galaxies look like. So in the left here, you see the original observation. Well, actually, these are simulated, I should say. So this is an observation, like a galaxy. And then this is the degraded part is like, okay, now you simulate how you look at from your telescope given a certain noise level. And then you have on the third image is the input recovered by GAN. And the fourth image is the input recovered by your usual denoising pipeline. And you think that, you know, you can see that this one is much clearer than the one to its right. And the reason for that is that the GAN can also use information about how typical galaxies look like to sort of fill in the blank and reduce uh, the noise level that is still present in the image. This for us is like liquid gold because, uh, you know, time at the telescope is expensive. And really, you know, to achieve more clarity, the only thing you can do is collect more photons. And, you know, typically these squares as, you know, one over square root of n, which means that, you know, the only thing you can do is observe something for more time. And you know, there's a lot of competition. So, you know, being able to achieve a better signal to noise ratio without having to observe for longer is big. And then, to the right, this is uh, an example in which we generate simulated galaxies. And I think I should have remembered, I think, you know, like one of these columns is real and the other is simulated. It's not quite as impressive because you're like, okay, you know, this is, yeah, I can do that. And it's true. But, you know, the idea that you can generate not just, you know, single objects, but entire populations 
that have the same statistical properties of something that are observed is really cool in order to be able to, you know, for example, make pipelines for, you know, detections or, you know, to prepare for upcoming experiments. Another one that is actually just becoming popular nowadays is recurrent neural networks. So these are structures in which the time variable also plays a role. So normally, you know, actually you know, the first image is sort of like is uh, rotating 90 degrees from how you usually see a neural network. We say input layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, and then output. And this is, you know, the same thing, but sort of like on the Y axis. So the information flows is only in the direction from input to output. Now, what happens in a recurrent neural networks is that uh, rather than just considering the input in making the decision, uh, the network also remembers the previous output. This means that you know, it knows what is said before uh, about the previous input, and this information also matters. And this means that now you can use sequences as inputs or outputs. You can do it in many ways. You have you know, like one-to-one, -one, that is sort of like the traditional thing, one bit of input, network, one bit of output, or you know, one-to-many or many-to-one or many-to-many, -many, which means that you, know, you can have a sequence in input and a sequence in output. And uh, RNNs are super popular in things like uh, um, natural language processing. Because for example, let's say that you know, I can feed it some biographical information about me, train the network, and then you know, ask the network to complete the sentence I was born in. And here, you know, to say Italy, this is something that the network will probably know. Uh, but um, if you just think about uh, uh, you know, how to answer, you would need to recognize that the important information here comes from like four words earlier. I and then born and then where. So uh, you, know, you need to be able to consider um, input that comes from not only like you know, an earlier bit, but also a bit that could be at a variable distance to from where you are. Why is it important in physics or astronomy? Well, for example, uh, in anomaly detection. Sometimes, you know, remember, or in you know, time domain data. Like to recognize that there is something strange happening at the telescope. Like for example, I don't know, maybe a supernova is exploding. You cannot really use you know, an absolute criterion like, okay, you know, I observe a bright source because that in itself is nothing strange. Like what matters is what you've been observing until now and how this is bearing with time. And so, and you know, a similar thing happens to detect, for example, detector failure. Like sometimes you don't have like a single indicator that will help you, but the fact that you have an anomalous sequence. And so these are something that we are just in the last few years starting to explore. And let's see, the last one that I have to admit I know the least about is autoencoders, and in particular, a class of them called variational autoencoders. And so in this case, now you know, usually you have sorted like input and output. Now for autoencoders, the output. You know, the goal is to generate an output that is a perfect copy of the input. Now you're like, okay, this is the identity matrix. You're fooling with me. I'm like, yeah, but there is a catch. And the catch is that you need to pass through a representation that is smaller. There is something called like the latent space or latent representation. And this means that uh, these can be used just as a straight dimensionality reduction process because the fact that, you know, you go here, you go in your smaller latent space. And then from there, you need to be able to basically reconstruct your input as the output needs to be as similar as possible to the input, means that you need to come up with something that is efficient. And so that's one nice thing. And then another, like there is one version of these autoencoders, which is the variation one, in which rather than just coming up with a latent space, we come up with a, uh, with a probability density function for the latent space. Now, this means that you can use this as a generative model because uh, you can actually sample from this probability density function that you have created. You have generated not just inputs, but an actual distribution. And so we have, you know, we are starting to explore these as well. 
So let's see how much time I have. Probably another 10 minutes is okay. Tobias, you feel? I wanted to leave time for questions, but if you say it's okay, okay. All right, so the other thing about neural networks is that, I mean, some of these things are new, right? Gans are from 2014, but a lot of them really have been around forever or, you know, at least for like, you know, since the 1960s. So why are they so popular now? And I think that, again, the answer for this is accessibility has changed. Now, let's see. How many of you have seen this beautiful picture before? <laughs> you can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> many of us have been <laughs> subject to this. But I think, you know, if you're here, you want to put in the chat whether or not you've seen this before, whether you recognize this this evil image. <laughs> Absolutely nice. <laughs> so, okay. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. ML 101 example one, exactly. Yes, and it is Yanlikan who's, you know, this is being used a lot as a benchmark for other things. Yes, I missed. Okay, I feel like, you know, you're all experts, but the one thing I wanted to show here is that, uh, you know, this has been used as a benchmark for like when new models come out and you want to see how they do. And so Yanlikan actually has this nice repository of, you know, like early, uh, analysis of this MNIST data set, which by the way, in case someone hasn't seen it, is a set of images that contain handwritten images of digits from zero through nine. And the goal of a typical classification algorithm would be to take uh, the images from here and to you know, create some sort of classification algorithm uh, they can recognize what has been written. And I think the original goal of this was used to sort of being able to route mail when we, know, when we still wrote a lot of, you know, snail mail so that, you know, like from the zip code, you could like sort this automatically. And the reason for this uh, is that now, you know, if I want to create an algorithm that can, you know, classify these handwritten digits with high accuracy, can just go on Colab. Now again, how many of you have used Colab? I'm guessing many from answers that I've seen here, but I'll click and then I'll probably have to reshare. Now, do you still see the slides? Okay, so. I'm gonna share this. And so this is how Colab looks like, right? It's free, right? If you have uh, a Google account, uh, you can also, you know, access Colab. And it is meant to host uh, Jupyter Notebooks. I'm sure you can host only, uh, also other things, but, you know, this is sort of like, you know, a platform that you can use to code, for example, in Python. Uh, you would connect to, I host the runtime, and you can actually choose uh, what type of architecture you're asking for. So here, you know, you can decide, okay, I want to use a GPU and, you know, Colab would try to kick you out. You know, they're pretty mean if, you know, if you ask for GPUs and you don't use them, but, you know, like for us, I think, you know, we have a case also, we'll just be here for a minute. So I think it's okay. And now, you know, if I want to, you know, create a model. It used to be the case that I have to write, you know, like a long, long set of codes. Here, I need about seven lines. So, you know, I'm working with this um, API called Keras that basically makes it very easy to write machine learning model. Even the data set itself is already there. I'm NIST. So, you know, I don't even have to load the data. Or, you know, or provide it. And then I'm gonna create a sequential model. I'm just gonna make, you know, like the silliest neural network using uh, a few of these layers. So let's see how this looks like. I'm importing this in two seconds. I'm using TensorFlow, which is like, you know, my back end. And then here, what do I do? I load the data. 
And because I'm a good machine learning practitioner, I know that I should split it in training and test because I cannot use the same examples, but to build the model and to evaluate. Then I'm reshaping it just so it can be used as input. And I have to normalize it. You know, These are sort of pixel intensities that we saw. So they have numbers from zero to 255. But neural networks, like many algorithms, they don't like to have things with too much of a range. So they're like, OK, let's make it 0 through 1. And then I'm doing this thing called one-hot encoding. I mean, I don't know really why it's called this way. <laughs> but the idea is that rather than asking to uh, output uh, my class, which would be the numbers 0 through 9, uh, I can say, OK, you know, like let's just transform this as uh, something that will have a check mark in the class that it has, in the class that I think is the most likely one. So this is done, downloading the data. I got my little green check mark. So this means that this is done. All right, let's take a look at it. And just to make it more fun, I'm like, okay, let me at least change the color map. So <laughs> we can visualize 25 objects just to see how they, looks like, how they look like. And so here I'm really just saying, okay, uh, for the first 25 objects of the training set, I want to see how they look like. We go. So you can see here that the color map tells you about the intensity of the pixels. So they go from zero, which is the background, uh, through one, which is you know like the uh, then the one that is written, and then you know in a gray scale, the ones around will be gray. Here, you know, we just go through some colors to see what happens. And you see that you know, many of them are decently, you know, for a human, are fairly easy to read, 5, 0, 4, 1, 9. Uh, but there are differences in how people write digits. And so you know, there is a bit of a range. So maybe, you know, for example, this one and this one, they are quite different. And so we're also asking, OK, hey, you need to recognize that these two type of things belong to the same class. Now, here's the model. When I say seven lines, actually, I think they are seven. This is how you write a convolutional neural network these days. You say, hey, my model is sequential, which means I'm just going to tell you which layers to add. And then my first layer is a convolutional one. And this is like, you know, I'm going to create my mini representation of the image. Um, and then I will do something called pooling, which just means that uh, if I have, you know, bits of image of the image that are let's say four by four pixels, I just take the average of the max actually in this max pooling just to make the image smaller. This dropout here is just meant to, uh, you know, kick down some of the weights of the network, about 20% of them at each step. And this helps with uh, not getting too affection to my training set. Flatten is really like reduce the output to an array. And then I have like one dense uh, layer uh, which will be my final classifier. So from there, I output some probability that each uh, image belongs to one class. And so the probability that the image is a zero, the probability that the image is a one, and so on. How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, eight, actually. Seven to build the model. But then I also have to compile it just you know, to put it together. All right, this is my model. And this is how I fit it. And I'm not going to go on for very long. I use 200 objects at a time, just so, you know, because my data set is larger than want to use it, all of them together. And then I'm going to ask, what's the final error? Or if you prefer the final accuracy. La, 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 la. OK, the first time is always a little bit slow. So let's see, it's an epoch one of 10. But then I think at some point, it seems to pick up speed. Maybe. We can only hope. OK, hopefully something is happening. So we need to wait for 10 of these epochs. And you know, one thing that we are monitoring here is the accuracy 
that we have. And this is like the one on the training set. And this is the one on our test set, the one that matters for us. And you know, hopefully we want to see these numbers increasing with increasing epochs. And so I believe we are now done. And the accuracy that we report is 1.14%, which means, sorry, the error rate, not the accuracy. Accuracy would be really bad, which means that basically um, uh, the, the model that we have built in this very, very simple way uh, only fails on a little over 1% of the examples. And this is not bad. In fact, I think, you know, we mentioned uh, Yan Li Khan work and I want to see, uh, let's see. Do you see my new tab in the browser? Yes, okay. So this is, oh no. I thought that this was public. This is not what I was looking for, but I'm a little bit surprised that it will be password protected. I don't know. I remember here there being, you know, like sort of like a list of how well different models can do on this data set. And you can show, and you know, I thought you could see, but anyway, uh, I guess not. You could see that, you know, it took about 30 years to get to this level of accuracy. And so I feel like, you know, what is the difference now is that, you know, like researchers who, you know, were aiming to do progress in machine learning and deep learning used to have to write all these things themselves, which took an enormous amount of time. While now we have that, you know, this type of tools, they are accessible. Um, there are a lot of resources, including many free resources to learn how to use them. And, you know, we can basically, even without you know, having studied too much about the background, write you know, seven lines of code, which I admit I've actually probably even copied from this source at one point uh, and get to this level. And so I think this is, uh, I think why these things are hugely popular. Now we can take a look at you know, how our predictions look like on some random numbers. Let's see, for example, 204. This is the image for 204. And then we can see what our model is predicting for that one. It's one, so, you know, not bad. And then this, I don't know why this is being so slow this morning. I wanted to show you also some of them that the, net, the model gets wrong. Because we only have, let me do this as with the 500. We only have like a 1% failure rate. So there are not too many. And so this means that, you know, like if we make predictions only for, uh, you know, like 10 or 100, we are not likely to find an error. But let's see if, you know, I know it takes a little bit, uh, but, you know, it will be fun to see um, if we can see at least a couple of the errors just to convince ourselves that, you know, maybe, you know, we have learned and maybe the ones that were classified wrongly uh, were actually things that are a bit harder to recognize even for a human. But I don't. in the meantime, I feel like as we wait for these predictions to be ready, uh, I don't know, do you have any questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you might have said it, but what's the, is there any estimate of the human failure rate? That's a very good question. I think that the labels are all human born. So I think human is infallible, but I don't know if- still win <laughs> in this game. <laughs> yes, but I don't know if there are- said what it is. <laughs> I think it would be cool, you know, to do it as a sort of, you know, like maybe class experiment. You know, there are, I think, you know, there are, I think 70,000 objects in the original data set. So I don't know if there's been an experiment sort of like citizen science and to see if there is any variance in the answers given by actual humans. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I don't know what is happening here. It's where I tried this at home and it was much faster, but we'll give it another minute. I guess anybody else has a question or a comment?
and also did, want did, to see. Yeah. Did, did you want to say? I mean, this has been a great talk. So I, I really, I really appreciate what you've done here and the breadth and the specific examples. But do you, you want to discuss a little bit what some of the possible pitfalls are in this? in terms like there are other adversarial examples that have been in the literature the last few years and there are issues like overfitting did you want to give a little bit of warnings for for someone who's not familiar with these sort of techniques definitely i feel like the basically the vast majority of the rest of my talk is about warnings so <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, I always say, you know, even when I teach this, I, you know, I spend the first semester, my sem first part of my semester, you know, like pumping students about machine learning, hey, so great. And the second part in sort of coming down the high and just, you know, like trying to say, okay, you know, really, this is nothing but a bunch of tools. If you, you know, don't use them responsibly. Uh, a lot of like bad things can happen. And so, yes, I feel like in, in a moment, I think we are gonna give to uh, get to there. And actually I'll try to uh, be fast on the other stuff to make sure that, you know, I can conclude in the next five or 10 minutes, uh, but it's exactly what I want to discuss and the ethics of it also. So thank you. So I guess this is somehow still running. So, you know, I'll leave it to its destiny. And, you know, if anybody's interested, I'm happy to share this. It's just like, you know, it's really like a tiny, uh, tiny uh, example. Uh, and we can see that in general, what happens is that, you know, you can sort of recognize why things were difficult. And understanding where the model tends to fail is also like a good part of diagnosing things. All right, so to go back to, slides and you know I try to describe a little bit the state of the art um, and now I wanted to say a few words uh, about where we are going next so I think for us one oh, oh no we definitely don't want to do everything again yeah so I think you know the two things that will uh, be important, especially in science in the next few years will be generalization. And so this is the understanding of you know, how your model behaves when it's applied outside the training domain and interpretability, which I think you know, is something that, especially for us in science is quite important. So generalization challenges is the fact that you know, a lot of time, let's say that you, know, you learn, you, know, you train a model in simulations, you want to apply to data. You know, how does it work? Or, you know, like you have learned, you know, a good representation of galaxies on one survey, and now you're moving to a different survey. And, uh, you know, how can we, one, compensate for differences, and two, you know, how can we get a fair assessment of, you know, how our model behaves when going outside the training domain? And one, of one important thing that we have started to show is that uh, this idea of transfer learning is very powerful. So this was one of the first papers looking at these in which they showed that if they could um, reuse what they had learned for SDSS galaxies for galaxies in another survey, the dark energy survey with a different depth and error model and just capability of the telescope, um, they would get not only significant improvement in accuracy in the morphological classification coming out of this, but also they could get to the same accuracy with a training set size that was one order of magnitude smaller. So very powerful. The thing that actually I've been working on a lot with very little result for now is, you know, are we able to actually predict uh, the performance, or if you prefer, the error of our algorithm as a function of the shift in domain. And so, in you know, in for example, you know, when we consider simulations and data, and you know, I think we would all agree that if simulations or data or just you know, like a training and application domain were completely um, the same from every possible statistical angle, then you know, we could believe what we learn. But the reality is that in general, they're just similar. And so this problem, I think, has a lot of nuance and something where I imagine seeing a lot of work um, being developed in the next few years. And for interpretability and explainability, I'm just going to say that there are several 
techniques that have been proposed in the computer science domain. And I think they're all useful, but I also feel like that I don't think we will be able to piggyback on this too much because I think, you know, in science, we have much higher standards for explainability. Like I feel like, you know, at least when I talk with like students or, um, you know, collaborators about, you know, what kind of things is science or what kind of things is, you know, publishable. I think that is very important that, you know, whatever it is that we put out has some, you know, provide some insights to others, right? It will, you know, like help people who read something that we write and say, hey, you know, like now I can learn something that also applies to my problem. And that's why I think just reporting results, I feel like falls a little short, especially if obtained with these machine learning models, right? If we can't provide something that says, hey, here is where it fails, here is where it performs well, and I understand why this happens. Then I think, you know, like we, I don't think this meets the standard for, you know, like the scientific method in practice. The last thing I wanted to discuss is, you know, what are the ethical concerns related to AI? And of course, this is like a very big topic and I really have no pretense of being able to talk about it uh, competently, but I also feel like this is something that we should talk about. So I think naively, we think about, you know, this algorithm as being less biased. In fact, I may have suggested this, right? I said, okay, here, you know, whenever we make a model, we decide the parameters, we introduce a bias, maybe we can move away from this. So I just want to talk to you about, you know, a couple of examples in which, you know, it was proposed to use artificial intelligence method for hiring. I could say Amazon at, at some point had this secret recruiting tool. And what did the secret recruiting tool learn? Well, it learned that, uh, um, you know, you absolutely shouldn't hire women. And, you know, if you think about it, you're like, oh no, how come the AI is biased? Well, of course, you know, what the AI is learning in this case is historically what has been the trend. And, you know, like at that time, which is like from a couple of years ago, uh, the vast majority of employees in technical roles, but also in the global headcount were male. So like, you know, like the single most important feature for being considered hireable that these models provided was being male. There was like another uh, study uh, where, you know, I think there was this like Torni who was vetting a resume screening tool. And then they said, okay, I'm gonna use one of these interpretability tools to figure out what's the most important feature that the model is learning about. And so, <laughs> The most uh, indicative feature of job performance found was that a candidate's name was Jared. And the second was whether they played high school lacrosse. So you can see that, you know, AI typically will just, you know, this is, you know, every AI algorithm is only as good as its training sample, first of all. And even more so, you know, like, so any biases that are uh, baked into that, will you know promptly transfer to any model that you build. Another thing that I wanted to show you is you know an example of this very popular type of generative adversarial networks called uh, StyleGAN. Uh, they were used um, you know again maybe a five years old algorithm. Uh, they were used to generate very realistic looking uh, pictures of people. Usually I have a little uh, poll here to see, okay, you know, like one row, this is real, two rows are fake, can you pick it? But actually, because I don't think I have a lot of time, I'm just gonna say that these are all fake. But at the same time, I think we could all agree that, you know, if we saw any single one of these pictures, we really would have no doubt that we're looking at the real one. There are no obvious flags and keep in mind that because the model is so new, this is probably like a much more flawed version than what is available today. And now this sounds like, you know, sort of like a nice novelty, right? But, you know, what, uh, you know, the thing that you can do with these things now is not just making images, but making video. So I'm gonna just play this one for a second. <laughs> Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained 
that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. For every human being who looks up at the moon in the nights to come will know that there is some corner of another world that is forever mankind. Good night. Now, as you probably have gathered, this was Richard Nixon, you know, like explaining that uh, the first uh, 1969 moon mission had failed. And this is, you know, the, the, the speech actually had been written, but this is what's just like, you know, an AI enacted speech. But I think this shows you, uh, you know, what the potential of just, you know, disseminating fake content is with these type of tools. Because I feel like, you know, we are used to the idea of fake news and, you know, like fake printed paper. But video, I think, is the one thing where we feel this is evidence. And, you know, like I live here, this is like the, uh, this, uh, uh, application that you know if you want you can like take a look that basically is able with just one image of the subject to basically overlap you know not just the face but you know to change the facial expressions just from one image so that you can get one person to give the speech of another person and so I feel like this is something that you know we really need to think about we're saying okay but we're scientists our stakes are lower but I don't think this means that we can sort of shy away from this discourse. One is because maybe we can give a contribution in understanding how to fight, you know, like the use of AI tools for evil purposes. The other is just because, uh, you know, also in science, there will be, I think, a lot of ethical challenges posed by, you know, like if we don't uh, understand what it means to have a fair use uh, of tools. So I'll just conclude saying, you know, what does it mean to be a scientist today? And, you know, usually when we think about being a scientist, we have this image of Einstein at the board. And so I want to say, you know, I think a lot of things from this image are outdated. First, hopefully you don't need to be a man. Second, hopefully you don't need to be old. Third, definitely you don't need, well, I don't know why this doesn't work, but you don't need to be at the board. And I guess like perhaps most importantly, you don't need or you shouldn't be alone. So I think the idea of the scientist as someone who's like, you know, locked in their offices doing things that are not relevant and, you know, like not caring about the outside world, I think is perhaps the most outdated uh, bit of this picture. So just as some final thoughts, I think that being a scientist will also be mean being a data scientist. And I think this is good. You know, it's just more tools that we have. I think that we should maintain the same standard for rigor when we use ML tools, which is a bit more difficult. And I think this is what makes machine learning applied to science different from machine learning in other fields, and which maybe like the goal is not to understand, but just to, I don't know, make a profit. And I think uh, it is our duty to have a high standard for reproduci reproducibility and sharing. And part of this is because, uh, you know, we need to protect ourselves against unethical uses. And I think one way to do that is to be transparent with the code that we put out to make it, you know, uh, so that everybody can reproduce it and check. And I also think that, you know, we cannot refrain from engaging in social discourse, in ethics training, and in mentoring. So I think it's not easy, but I think it's super worth it. And I'll finally stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's give Viana a round of virtual applause. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic presentation. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. So I would just open the floor if you have a questions. Yes. Yeah, and I saw one in the chat, so maybe yes. I'll, I'll go with this first. Would you agree that the, with the people that say Ptolemy models were one of the first appearances of data science? Absolutely, I will go, you know, like even earlier than that. I just feel like, you know, we made this, you know, fancy uh, big world, uh, but I, you know, I think we have been doing science with data for a long time. So if we want to think of data science as, 
you know, using special tools or, you know, only big data. Yes, but to me, you know, data science is definitely something that starts with just the curiosity of humankind for exploration and for collecting observation and trying to interpret them. Fantastic. Other questions? Do you have any thoughts about what we should be teaching in K through 12 in the way of mathematics and or science that helps people take advantage of uh, data science ideas and methodologies? Oh, that's a fantastic question. And you know, I haven't thought about it nearly as much as I should have. You know, I thought about it, how, what to do in college and you know, for our uh, physics major, you know, we have introduced a lot of these things, but I feel like I really, hope that I think just from like, you know, in K through 12, we teach about, well, in general, the process of scientific thinking and things like, you know, for example, what we call it guesstimating, you know, estimated orders of magnitudes, finding ways of, you know, checking your answer, being comfortable with the open-ended question. This is something that I see a lot in my students is that, you know, if you always had something that, you know, has an answer in the back of the book, I think you can be very uncomfortable just facing a question that is open-ending and reasoning about that. So I would say a lot of analytical thinking and of course coding. And I think this really needs to start with pseudocode. I mean, I love pseudocode. I always do it, you know, like if I'm thinking of a problem, I seriously cannot deal with it. If I don't have some sort of pen and paper and I write some sort of flow chart that says, you know, this is what I have to do. And I found that, you know, just sort of like uh, training, uh, young students like kids in terms of, you know, like sequence of operation and cause and effect can be very powerful. And yeah, and hopefully, you know, now I think they do hopefully start to learn coding. I'll let you know, I'll let you know, as you know, I have my own five-year-old experiment. Of course, she, she's only interested in art at the moment, but, you know, I'm curious to see of how her, uh, you know, pattern will be different from mine in terms of what you learn in the early ages. Uh, Okay, I have a couple in the chat, so maybe I'll go through them. What do you think could cause the third AI winter in terms of like something where we see a decline in, um, you know, how much AI tools are used? I'm, I mean, I'm not sure really. The only thing I can think of now is a point in which uh, because of the, uh, you know, stark inequality in the distribution of resources, uh, I can imagine that, you know, we'll get to a point in which only, you know, like a very small fraction of people have access to state-of-the-art algorithms. I don't know if it will be an AI winter because I do still feel that, you know, a lot of things can be accessed. But I, I worry a lot about this that I call like an accessibility issue, even, for example, in the science community where, you know, like not everybody has been trained in things like machine learning, but now it's so widely used that now you have a big part of the community who, you know, like is not able to read and understand papers. And so I feel like, you know, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, like students in some places and some universities will have access to much better resources than others. So this is what I see as like the main big issue, which I don't know if it was something that would accept, that would affect everybody, but I really worry for, you know, our community. Um, I'll go to Julinda and then Patrice who's raising hand. Okay, so I'm sorry if I already answered, no, I didn't. When are data science classes offered in CUNY? Well, I don't know. I mean, I teach once a year at least, I teach machine learning for physics and astronomy. And I should also say I wrote this book. Well, I mean, it's not out yet, but I finally gave it to my publisher. So, you know, it should come out hopefully in a year or so. And, you know, all the content will be public. So you're in, you know, I'm also working on an online course right now at the foundation uh, that then will be offered for free to any student interested in getting started uh, and with a physics or astronomy background. So I'll definitely publicize that. Um, I think the Graduate Center has several classes in machine learning data science that are offered on a periodical basis. So I would definitely check their computer science curriculum and then in your own college perhaps, or, or you know, I don't know if you are associated with one college, uh, I think, you know, each college individually 
we'll have some, but I don't know if we have a centralized directory, unfortunately, maybe this is something we should think of. Yeah, and the Graduate Center has a master's program in data science. Oh, perfect, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Excellent. Patrice, yes. Hello? Yeah. Uh, back, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, hi. It, yeah, oh. sorry, my computer has been super slow, so I haven't put up my, my, my camera uh, earlier, but I'm happy my mic turned on right away. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, first, thank you so much for this presentation. It helps rejog a lot of what you taught us in the um, uh, ML uh, a couple of semesters back. Um, and so, yeah, it's really exciting to kind of learn more about it. Um, and I'm just curious to know about the flat, at the Flatiron uh, Institute, mostly is, is, um, is AI mostly the tool that you're using um, to kind of analyze the galaxies or is there other work that's involved um, there? Is there more to studying astronomy than, than you're covering? Oh yeah, yeah, there is definitely a lot more. And this is the part where I feel like, okay, this is just, I really think of these machine learning things as, you know, well, I really think about, of them as nicely packaged linear algebra, to be fair, in many cases. But I think, yes, in general, I think, you know, I think the Flatiron has a nice breadth of, in general, it's like computational astrophysics, and they also have, you know, computational biology and quantum physics. And so this is really like a widespread of methods. So you can have things like what we have in our computational methods and, you know, like or something Tobias was mentioned, like, hey, you know, you know, differential equations, how to solve them numerically, you know, and, you know, for example, in the field of like simulations or, you know, fluid dynamics, this is still like of incredible importance. And then, you know, even when to study galaxies, you know, the whole pipeline of understanding data, it's always mix and match. You know, so you may do like, you know, a little bit of this with machine learning, but this is never be the whole pipeline you have you know the whole data reduction process and then you have the interpretation oh. which is really big right you know it's one thing to say okay you know this is what is happening and this is like i find myself with like 10 spiral galaxies and 20 ellipticals but then what does this mean in terms of galaxy evolution you know does this agree with our model of how galaxies form and evolve or not and if not you know like where is that my theory cannot explain what I'm observing? And this is what I feel like, these are really like, you know, the big question in science. And that's why I think still ML is like a tool. It's like another thing. It's like, you know, the same way I can, you know, now compute gradients numerically or solve differential equations numerically or plot and visualize things. You know, I feel like this goes in the same category of, you know, opening up ways of doing research but I feel like, you know, the goals are still very much defined by the things that we want to know. Understood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. A. Also, so, I'm sorry, one more. I want to throw one more in there. I know that you're writing a book and this is, it, you know, it will take us step by step through, um, I guess, the intro of how to use machine learning within astronomy. Um, but then uh, I guess my question is, I guess going back to what you said about the papers and not not them not being totally intelligible to everybody, um, is would is there an uh, an article that you would recommend or from a journal that kind of like because um, recently I found a lot of of work that kind of details the history of all the kind of like research that's gone into certain areas, and I thought maybe there could be a really good paper <laughs> that's intelligible that has like that kind of history that someone starting off, you know, could just read and like get a get a, a good sense of all of the different um, algorithms that could be used and like. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a good answer. And you know, like recently I was uh, I, like for a conference, I sort of like tried to do a little bit of literature review on this and I couldn't find something that maybe just because the field is relatively new. So I'm sure people are writing reviews as we speak. I just, you know, oh. don't have one. I think Dahlia Baron has a nice, uh, I'm gonna put her name in the chat. And uh, I think these were sort of like notes for uh, a school. And often these are sort of right, uh, you know, at the, the hit the right spot of it, you know, like being overview and, you know, with just a little, a technical thing. I think that, you know, like David Schwab has one that is like, you know, more general for physics, not quite for astro, but I think, you know, it's a, it's a very nice reference. So it's called a, a low bias high variance or a high bias low variance. I would say I'm going to say a low bias high variance. 
and David, maybe if you have like the archive number ready, if you're here, or you know, if you, I'm sure if you Google this, you will find. And this also okay. has really nice sort of overview of uses in physics, and it also comes with Jupyter notebooks and the data. And so you know, like you can also sort of play with that a lot. Awesome! Thank you so much, Dr. A. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank you, Mr. Sheffer. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure there are many, many other questions. And, um, but I would think maybe we'll just take a break here. Thanks again. Another, another round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fantastic. My pleasure. My pleasure. Let's take a little break and then we'll um, reconvene at 1 p.m. Uh, with the next, next talk. And it's all about topology and data science and um, really looking forward to it. So hope to, uh, I'll leave the, the room open and I hope to see you all in a little while for the next talk. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Bye. So, so welcome back or you might just have joined us now. Uh, I'm to be a Schaefer from the College of Staten Island and in mathematics and in the, on the physics faculty at the Graduate Center. Welcome to our second talk of the machine learning and data science event um, organized by ITS. And um, yeah, just let's go, let's dive right into this, our second talk. Thank you so much, Mikael, for joining us and um, talking today. And we're going to learn about geometry and topology in data science and machine learning. Thank you so much. And Mikael, you have the floor. Thanks. Thank you very much for inviting me. I was <clears throat> unfortunately, unfortunately forced to miss the first talk of today, but I'm hoping the rest of the event will uh, be as excellent as it seemed in the, uh, when reading about it in advance. I figured I'd, so I'm also College of Staten Island Mathematics. Uh, Tobias was in fact the person leading my hiring committee, if I remember correctly. And I'm uh, also active at the Graduate Center in uh, the computer science PhD and the data science master's programs where I'm uh, currently deputy chair as well as active faculty. I figured I'd spend today talking a little bit about a couple of different, uh, slightly more esoteric uh, directions in related to uh, data science and machine learning that I find exciting. And so, the plan for today is to tell you a little bit about each of four different fields. So I'll be talking about topological data analysis, which is my home field. It's where I do most of my research. Uh, and in topological data analysis, we leverage linear algebra to compute something called homology uh, on data sets. And homology will give you a measure of uh, disconnectedness of uh, uh, how many clusters you may find in the data, whether there are any holes or any bubbles in the data. Then I'll be talking a little bit about geometric data analysis, uh, which I choose to understand as a pretty uh, widely spread uh, set of techniques, uh, all of which use manifolds in some way uh, or another to estimate point cloud data or properties of point cloud data. I'll be talking a little bit about information geometry, which also uh, relies on a lot of manifold theory and uh, uses uh, differential geometry, but uh, uses it instead of studying uh, data sets themselves, it uh, shifts the attention to study statistical methods and their properties in particular, in information geometry, you build manifolds where each point corresponds to some distribution and uh, use that to study a family of distributions all at once. And finally, I'll be talking about algebraic statistics, where you use algebraic geometry to study statistics. And I'll sneak in a little uh, side note there. I'm lately uh, started looking a little bit at uh, what's being done using category theory to study statistical models. So I'll convey a little bit about what that looks like as well. So the idea here is to give you many glimpses of different fields and hopefully uh, entice some of you to uh, pick up and read up on some of it 
Um, so I want to, I want to tickle your fancy. I want to provoke, uh, provoke interest, uh, so that maybe more people can get enthusiastic about uh, these perspectives uh, than uh, we already have. All of these uh, approaches have one thing in common, and I'm gonna start talking about uh, that one thing. Sort of a little bit of a battle call of uh, this entire range of uh, research fields is that uh, shape matters. Uh, the idea of leveraging geometry and topology is all about somehow getting access to the shape of something and believing that the shape of something will tell us things. Uh, so the slogan has, uh, has been popularized primarily in topological data analysis would be that data has shape and shape matters. And so for starters, when I say that data has shape, uh, I mean that data sets are in some ways intrinsically geometric. And the meshes we put on data sets uh, often have geometric meanings or ge geometric ana uh, analogies uh, that can be really useful uh, to pay attention to. So when we compute a mean, uh, for instance, that gives us a location for the data sets, that gives us a way of distinguishing uh, different data sets based on uh, where in the ambient uh, data space uh, they are located. Uh, variance and covariance uh, gives you measures of how much the data spreads out and in what directions. Uh, PCA will fit a best matching coordinate system to the data. And this idea of fitting a best matching coordinate system should sound um, familiar if you've been, uh, and in, 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 if you have been encountering manifolds in your past, it's very similar to choosing coordinate charts uh, for manifolds, figuring out what coordinates look like right where you are, right, right at the location you happen to be interested in, and fitting a coordinate system to that location. And then clustering, finally, uh, I hope you can all see it here. Uh, here we have three clusters. I have blue triangles. Uh, and my pen that I was hoping to use is not co cooperating. I have blue triangles here at the top. I have uh, red, uh, red circles in the middle and green cube, uh, green squares at the bottom, trying to indicate uh, that this particular point cloud I'm showing as an example could imaginably be, sp be, be split into three parts that are internally more coherent than they are uh, between the parts. That, that's the basic idea of uh, doing clustering. And the shape matters. Uh, the choice you make of what data analysis tools to use will impose assumptions uh, on uh, 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 that, that, that shape your conclu conclusions. And these assumptions often have a geometric flavor and may or may not actually be uh, reflected well by the data itself. So a typical example here would be something like linear regression, where for a simple linear regression, the assumption is that your data is close to a line. In more general, in a multi, uh, multiple regression setting, the assumption is that your data stays close to an affine hyperplane, that it's close to some sort of flat plane somewhere in your data space. And of course, a lot of data doesn't do this. Uh, it's easy to imagine, and I'm sure most of you have seen at times, data sets that spread out in curves of different kinds. Uh, and so in the linear regression case, when we teach linear regression, we often also teach a collection of diagnostic plots that help us figure out when the assumption is unwarranted, help, help us figure out from the data itself when the assumption of having uh, such a straight line or flat plane uh, uh, flat, 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 flat plane uh, is not actually true to the data. So is there a question in the chat uh, about my choice of, uh, about my uh, saying it's an affine hyperplane? So an um, affine hyperplane is uh, <clears throat> uh, 
an offset version of a vector space. So if you were to take a sub vector space of your data space, uh, the axioms for how vector spaces work force you to include the zero uh, vector in the subspace, uh, just by virtue of how vector spaces are defined in the first place. And uh, the aff affine portion here allows us to put in an offset vector so that points in the affine hyperplane sit on an hyperplane that has been moved uh, perpendicular to the hyperplane itself away from the origin, away from the zero somehow, and allows us to place it in a more general position. It's the, in the uh, one dimensional case, it's the difference between a proportion proportionality relationship and a linear relationship. Um, with a bit of luck, I might have my pen active now. So uh, uh, affine line would be something like this, whereas a uh, non-affine line would be forced to go through the origin here. And in uh, when, when we're talking about straight lines, we have a language uh, set up that already deals with this. We're all used to seeing straight lines and straight line equations where the line goes away from the origin. But when you want to ramp up to uh, discuss uh, hyperplanes, it can become important to make the distinction that we are assuming here that it doesn't have to go through the origin. And so vector space methods in isolation is not going to be applicable. There's a little bit extra going on beyond just linear algebra when you're dealing with an affine hyperplane. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. So in machine learning toolkits, we also see this. Uh, and in, uh, one, one thing that happens is where that uh, different machine learning methods, uh, different classification methods come with uh, decision boundaries that have different properties, where the properties themselves may or, uh, may, or may not uh, be particularly nice. And that has uh, implications for things like generalizability whether you're able to say something outside uh, the domain you've been training on, whether extrapolation works well or not. And so some things you might see show up in uh, uh, properties of decision boundaries are things like it might be disconnected. You might have, uh, if you're doing something like a K nearest neighbor classification, where you just look at the neighbors and you compute some sort of uh, mean class from your neighbors and take, or most common class of your neighbors and take that, you may very well see islands pop up uh, so that the individual classes you're classifying into are not connected with each other. You might have decision boundaries that are piecewise linear or that are not piecewise linear. You may have decision boundaries that are smooth. And sometimes these uh, properties of the decision boundaries may actually be uh, and, and end up being quite, quite important for uh, the analysis you're trying to do. So uh, one interesting thing when we're uh, looking to expand our toolboxes would be to control and limit the amount of implicit assumptions uh, that our new tools place on our data. Um, we are always going to be putting assumptions on our data. Uh, that's uh, part of the game that we play, but we would like to be able to, at the very least, be aware of which assumptions we are uh, projecting onto the data, and we would like to be able to limit the extent we rely on uh, heavy assumptions uh, when we propose new methods. So, as I said earlier in uh, the roadmap, um, in this talk I'm uh, describing four approaches to that all on some level follow the same, uh, the same battle call of data has shape and shape matters. And they differ in how we actually measure that, that shape uh, that we decided uh, is important. <clears throat> in topological data analysis, we use techniques from algebraic topology. Um, and in particular, it turns out that um, most amenable to computation and therefore most amenable to building practical methods out of 
turns out to be the method of homology, uh, which translates topological questions, questions about connectivity uh, into linear algebra. And linear algebra is easy. We know how to deal with matrices and vectors, and we have highly optimized uh, software packages we can draw on for that. In geometric data, data analysis, uh, we're going to be pulling on Riemannian geometry, on differential geometry, on the idea of manifolds, and looking at what kinds of things uh, remain in the toolbox when we decide that the only thing we're going to get out of the data is a notion of distance. In information geometry, uh, we will see how specific model families in classical statistics have uh, differential ge ge geometric properties that can be really fruitful to draw on uh, to prove things about statistical methods themselves or to extend notions of uh, statistics uh, in a way that is motivated by the geometry, geometry we're inspired by. And in algebraic statistics, uh, one of the main observations is that a lot of classical uh, statistical constructions have really interesting interpretations in algebraic geometry and can also drive development of new algebraic geometry. Uh, so in all of these fields, uh, we end, there, there ends up being a really interesting uh, interchange between the fields. Not only does algebraic topology, Riemannian, ge Riemannian geometry or algebraic geometry influence the data science approach, but the problems we meet in building data science out of these fields uh, creates interesting problems for the fields themselves. So we get advances in algebraic geometry or algebraic topology that are motivated by and driven by uh, observations and needs in the data science applications. So I want to start out with uh, the most familiar to me corner, the, my, my, my home field uh, with topological data analysis. And in Topological data analysis, uh, there are several different appro popular approaches to build data analysis methods uh, out of topology. They all build on representing data as a discrete topological space. We want it to be discrete because we want to be able to do computation very easy, and we want to do computation algorithmically. We want the computer to do, do the work for us. Uh, and so most of the work uh, ends up um, constructing simplicial complexes uh, where you have a combinatorial gluing together of triangle looking building blocks. So you get uh, constructions that uses edges. And uh, yes, I'm trying to do that right now. I'm trying to explain what I mean by the term simplicial. So uh, by simplicial uh, complex, I mean an assembly of uh, points, lines, uh, triangles, uh, tetrahedra, and higher dimensional uh, analogs that we in general call synthesis. The simplex, uh, if you want a formal definition of it, can be thought of as the, uh, the convex hull of uh, unit vectors in Rn. So, uh, the simplex delta n is uh, the hull of n unit vectors. Uh, and this gives you a family of building blocks. And the idea when constructing a simplicial complex is that you're only allowed to connect these building blocks in, uh, you're only allowed to intersect them in full subsimplices. So you're allowed to put edges together uh, by matching uh, start and end nodes. You're allowed to put triangles together by having them share an edge or share a vertex. But you're not allowed to have a, a line pierce through a triangle or you're not allowed to connect uh, triangles offset from each other so that they're only covering, they're only intersecting along parts of an um, edge. So this makes it all uh, get kind of the same feeling as Meccano or Lego um, building. You have blocks that fit together very 
uh, very neatly in well-defined connecting, uh, connecting surfaces, and you can build bigger shapes out of those. Another common uh, thing for people to use are cubicle com. Uh. Um. Are things called cubicle complexes? Uh, where the building blocks are uh, squares and cubes. Yes, in the construction that I will show you in a moment, each data point creates a vertex in the simplicial complex. And that's true for most, but not all uh, construction ways. In cubicle complexes, you might take uh, pixels or voxels as your building blocks. So for the people who, do, who want to do image analysis, the cubicle complex approach ends up being a lot more attractive. Whereas for people who work uh, on data that is more comfortably interpreted as point clouds, uh, the simplicial approach uh, becomes more attractive. So once we have these simplicial complexes, uh, we can do homology, where we use linear algebra to find holes or bubbles. We can do cohomology, where we find functions on the data uh, using uh, almost the same linear algebra as we do with homology. And there's a construction called mapper that has found a lot of traction where we construct a simplicial complex model from the data uh, by giving it a function that dictates how the data spreads out, what things to consider close and what things to consider far away from each other and are able to impose uh, distinctions on the data through choosing uh, uh, an appropriate function to view uh, the data through. And back we get a simplicial complex that we often display using graph layout algorithms and uh, uh, that we can then go on and use as a visualization tool or, or as a tool for further analysis. So um, here's how the simplicial complex construction goes. Uh, the simplest way to do it is to use what's called a check complex. And you fix some scale epsilon, and you pick vertices to be the data points. Uh, just like uh, Srinivas uh, was asking in the chat, our data points are going to be the vertices of the construction. So the points in the simplicial complex are going to be the point, points that form our data. And then we connect uh, a collection of uh, vertices. I see I missed x1 here, but of course x1 is also part of this list. Um, so we collect a set of d plus one vertices to each other. If the intersection of uh, balls of radius epsilon centered at the, these vertices is non-empty. And so what does that look like? Well, we start out with a bunch of points. And we add uh, balls of radius epsilon uh, to each point. And uh, I see my attempts at making these graphics look prettier didn't work. Um, now that we have these uh, balls in place, we look, at, look for intersections. And whenever we see an intersection, uh, we put in a simplex uh, representing that intersection. So uh, where we have a triple intersection here that gives rise uh, to this triangle here because we had a triple intersection in, in the balls. And what we're left in in the end is this nice combinatorial, uh, uh, combinatorial uh, object that carries a lot of the geometric information in the data set for us. And we can pick this thing up and start applying algebraic topological methods uh, to it. Um, another very common uh, approach is the Vitoris Rips complex. And in the Vitoris Rips complex, uh, we connect vertices if the pairwise distances is less than our threshold epsilon. So in the check complex, we looked for epsilon uh, balls intersecting. Now we're looking for pairwise distances. 
If a triangle is not filled in, that means that it's not a simplex. I'm using blue here to indicate where the simplices are. But you're picking up on something important because the distinction between the torus rips complexes and uh, check complexes is that uh, the torus rips complex will fill in all triangles, all cliques in the underlying graph will become simplices in the Vitoris Rips complex. So it ends up being the click complex. It ends up being the simplicial com the uh, richest simplicial complex possible with a given underlying edge graph. So adding all of the simplices that we could possibly add is how we build a click complex. The Vitoris Rips complex is the click complex of the check complex. So Anywhere we could add a simplex, we need to add a simplex to be build the Vitoris Rips complex. But yes, in the check complex, you may very well end up with situations uh, where triangles are not filled in. That will happen when you have uh, three balls intersecting like this. So you have pairwise intersections, pairwise intersections, pairwise intersections, but a tiny little uh, Open, uh, open space in the middle, which doesn't get filled in, which makes these empty triangles pretty short-lived if we were, and unstable. If we were to adjust this uh, radius by just a little bit, a lot of them may go away. Uh, but this uh, idea of adjusting the uh, epsilon, I'm going to return to that, but first I wanna give you a notion of what homology is about because I want you to have the linear algebra idea in place once we start going in and messing with uh, what scale to work at. So with this simplicial complex in place, we can compute something called homology. And it is a vector space uh, that whose dimension measures holes and bubbles in the simplicial complex. The idea is we break up the simplicial complex into building blocks. And for each set of building blocks, and by building blocks here, I mean the uh, individual simplices. So points, edges, triangles, simplices, uh, tetrahedra, higher simplices. And for each possible dimension, we create a vector space uh, that has a base set given by the simplices of that dimension. And my attempts at ed editing the slides are failing again. Um, this was supposed to uh, not be a big white blob. Uh, but what I'm trying to show is that for, uh, for the first of these vector spaces, we have a one basis element for each vertex. Uh, for the second, uh, we have one uh, uh, basis vector for each edge. For the third, we have one for each, uh, for each triangle. And so these end up being named C0 for the vertices, C1 for the edges, C2 for the triangles with the number indicating the dimension of the simplex. And the C uh, stands for chains, uh, which is uh, the algebraic topolo topology term for these vectors composed out of uh, simplex building blocks. These simplices have boundaries and that ends up being the by far the most important property of them in a homological uh, approach. So the boundary of a simplex is built out of simplices one dimension lower. The boundary of a triangle is uh, the three edges around the triangle. And um, we define the boundary to be these three edges with alternating sign uh, for uh, algebraic reasons. And so the boundary of a triangle is one edge plus the other edge minus the third edge. The boundary of an edge is the end uh, point minus the starting point. And extending these uh, from just the basis vectors to the entire chain uh, vector spaces gives us a linear map that we call the boundary map. When you put together a path of edges, uh, the endpoints end up appearing 
in the boundary with opposite signs. So this point shows up once as part of this edge and once again as part of this edge. And it will be the starting point in one and the end point in the other. And uh, as I said on the previous slide, start points and end points have opposite signs. So uh, they end up canceling each other. And so when you have a path, the boundary is still go, go only going to be start point and end points. And if these end, start and end points coincide, then they cancel each other out as well. So if you have a cycle, uh, then you get a boundary of zero. Uh, it vanishes. Uh, by this point where, uh, by, by the time we're starting to use the uh, topology, uh, we want to, uh, by the time we create the simplicial complex, we want to work with the combinatorial structure of the simplicial complex. And so we ignore uh, the coordinates in ambient data space at this point. And what's important is what are the uh, simplicial uh, building blocks and how do they connect to each other? And so um, vector in C0 is just a formal linear combination of vertices. Uh, vector in C1, is a formal linear combination of edges. So um, I might write, uh, if I introduce names for the vertices, I might write the chain to the left, the sequence of three edges. I might write it as AB plus BC plus CD. So that the coordinates for the edge AB is one, for the edge BC is one, and for the edge CD is one. What I'm trying to write here is that the uh, boundary of this formal linear combination is going to be B minus A for, from the edge AB uh, plus C minus B from the edge BC plus D minus C from the edge CD. And now we have B shows up twice, uh, once with a plus one coordinate, once with a minus one coordinate. C shows up twice, once with a plus one and once with a minus one coordinate. And so they cancel each other out and we're left with uh, D minus A, which corresponds to the start and end points of the entire sequence of edges. So the high, uh, whole idea is to drop the focus of coordinates we get from the data and put the focus fully on connectivity structures here. And we can use this property that the endpoints cancel out uh, to form a definition. It's, it can allow us to, not only is it what happens when uh, we get cycles in a graph theoretic sense, we can use it to define what being a cycle should mean to begin with. So we define a, a cycle to be, be something that has a boundary of zero. And we call the, because of that, we call the kernel of the boundary map, the cycle group. And there are cycles that are not surprising to see. Uh, the boundary of a boundary is empty. If you take a disk, the disk will have a boundary circle, but the, that boundary circle is not going to have a boundary. And that's an intrinsic feature of taking boundaries of things. Um, so uh, the reason we have these alternating signs, uh, one reason we have the alternating sign set up uh, in the boundary map is in order to enforce uh, this exact equation that the boundary of a boundary should be empty. So because the boundary of a boundary is empty, it means that the image of the boundary map is going to be a subgroup uh, of the cycle group. Everything in the image is going to be a cycle. And it's not surprising that the things that are in the image of the boundary are going to be cycles. That's what we're trying to make happen when we're uh, deciding that the boundary of a boundary should be empty. So we call a chain a boundary if it is in the image, if, there is a, if it has some pre-image some pre under the boundary map. And we call the image uh, the boundary group. And what we would like to do to make this uh, model topology is we would like to be able to nudge our cycles back and forth across parts of the shape. Uh, we want to be able to continuously modify the curves or surfaces that we're modeling 
as long as the modification stays within the space uh, that we're uh, allowing things to move in. And so we want to model uh, homotopy invariance. And the boundaries tell us exactly when that is possible. So we want, in the image here to the left, we want the two blue cycles to be considered the same. And the two blue cycles here differ exactly by the boundary of the purple thing. We add one component of the boundary of the purple thing and remove two components to move from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And so the essential cycles that we get out of this, up to this nudging uh, equivalence, are exactly the vector space quotient of cycles mod boundaries. We define this to be the homology group and take this to be the thing that carries essential topological information for us. For some examples, uh, the sphere will have zeroth homology, that is the connected components given by a one-dimensional vector space, one-dimensional homology given by a zero vector space. And the reason for that is if you have any sort of uh, closed curve on the surface of the sphere, you can continuously deform it down to just a single point without ever leaving the sphere surface. And it has a two-dimensional homology measuring enclosed uh, bubbles of one dimension, uh, measuring exactly the interior of the sphere. Whereas the hollow torus has, again, one component. We have a one-dimensional zero homology. It has two essential types of uh, closed curves that we cannot contract. One that lies around um, the ring uh, transversally, and one that goes around long longitudinally. And so these two closed curves cannot be shrunk down to a point. They will get stuck on the ring itself or on the hole in the middle of the ring uh, when we're trying to contract them. So we get two different uh, non uh, two different holes, two different. Uh, uh, non-contractible uh, loops for the torus. And again, we have one enclosed space, so we get a one-dimensional uh, degree two homology group. And so H0 will measure for us how many pieces does it have. H1 measures how many incontractible loops. H2 measures how many enclosed voids. And hand-waving a little bit and uh, ignoring uh, pathological case, cases. HN measures uh, voids enclosed uh, uh, enclosed by um, n-dimensional uh, hypersurface. So uh, exactly like Srinivas is say, uh, saying in the chat, the reason we can't shrink the circle stop point is because the torus is hollow. I'm only consider considering the surface of the torus. If we had a solid torus, if the interior of the torus was also a part uh, of the topological space we're studying, then we would be able to shrink uh, the transversal circle and we would no longer have an enclosed void. So H1 and H2 would both go down by uh, one dimension. But all of this, uh, I, 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 I said when I started defining the check in the Vitoris Ritz complex, that the first thing we do is we pick a scale. Um, and then that is a bit unsatisfactory. What scale should we have uh, when we're doing these things? We could just try picking some scale and do the computation and we get out something like this where we get three uh, holes. Uh, one that goes around the entire figure here and uh, two small ones that go around very small uh, openings. So maybe that wasn't the right scale. Maybe we, we should just have picked a little bit bigger scale. So let's see what happens if we grow the scale a little bit. The two holes that we had fill in because they were at a very small scale. But we end up getting a new edge, bridging a gap down here, creating a new loop. So neither this nor this gives us the right result in computation. We have spurious features at both scales. And you can build uh, malicious examples that have spurious features of pretty much all scales uh, 
uh, you're studying. Or you can build uh, examples. I have some in uh, some of the work I've done where there are multiple relevant scales to work at. So picking a single scale is not a stable choice. It's sensitive to small changes, and it can have a dramatic effect on the features that we're detecting. So that's not what we're going to do. Instead, we'll study all scales at once. The scale, by scale here, I mean the choice of epsilon. Yes, that's exactly what I mean by scale. So the idea is we study all scales at once. And we can do that using functoriality and representation theory. Uh, so some of my favorite corners of algebra come to, come to rescue here. Um, the first observation is that homology is functorial. If you have a map of topological spaces, it will induce a linear map on homology, and it respects composition. So if we have a sequence of interesting scales, interesting epsilons that we're interested in, uh, from this sequence, we get a sequence of inclusion maps between corresponding simplicial complexes, like, for instance, the vitreous rips complexes. Because as the scale grows, you will never lose a uh, simplex that has shown up, because they all depend on certain distances being shorter than whatever the chosen epsilon is. So you can only get more synthesis uh, when, when you grow the scale. So you will have proper inclusion maps between the simplicial complexes. And by the functoriality of homology, we get a sequence of linear maps between the homology groups. And it turns out there's a uh, well-known uh, theorem in representation theory by Gabriel from 1972 that says that if you have a diagram of vector spaces like this, it will decompose into a direct sum of component diagrams, each of which is one dimensional with identity maps for all the, uh, where all the arrows are in a connected interval along the sequence, and it will be zero elsewhere. So what this means, translating it out from the algebra, is that we can make a simultaneous basis change for all the homology groups at all the scales, so that each induced topological feature gets mapped as by the identity map uh, between one scale and the next for as long as that feature uh, exists in the complex itself. And the results we can describe using only the start and end indices of these connected intervals corresponding to a feature. And each feature that we find corresponds specifically to one of these intervals. And by feature, uh, feature here, I mean things like disconnected components, like uh, incontractable loops or enclosed uh, voids, exactly the kinds of things I've been uh, showing you uh, before. So from a data set, we can get a description of the topology in, uh, as a multiset of intervals. And these descriptors are stable in the sense that if the point cloud changes, by just a small amount, then the endpoints of the intervals can only change by that amount. We might be, we might uh, get uh, length zero intervals, or we might get uh, that 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 we can uh, sort out and ignore. We might get short intervals come into existence. We saw that with the bridge uh, bridge edge that suddenly a new feature came into existence when the scale increased. But that's fine because it's guaranteed to all happen at very small scales. Uh, the length, the time, the span of different epsilons where these uh, unstable uh, things happen is bounded by the amount of difference we have and by the amount of noise we have uh, between the data sets that we're comparing. So people do a bunch of different things with this. Uh, one of the first um, big uh, hits uh, of the field was studying three by three pixel patches in natural images. And it was already known uh, uh, from David Mumford that these pixel patches concentrate on a circle that corresponds to linear gradients in different directions. But it turns out that if you uh, throw more topological tools at it, you can actually identify a Klein bottle of uh, High, highly concentrated three by three pixel patches. And this Klein bottle structure can be used to create compression algorithms for images, to con uh, con construct rotation invariant signatures for image textures. And uh, 
there's a bunch of ongoing research right now into how to use it to inform a convolutional neural network to do com various computer vision tasks and give it an awareness of the underlying topology. Another of my favorite areas uh, people have been applying this is in studying chemical properties of zeolites, a particular kind of periodic uh, chemical compounds where you get pores in the periodic uh, structure. And by using this persistent homology, you can study, you can get signatures of these pore structures. They can use to pre-screen a uh, family of interesting compounds and try to learn through a machine learning algorithm at figuring out the correspondence between the persistent homology and the uh, chemical properties um, use that to pre-screen what compounds you want to spend time simulating or synthesizing before you spend all the time on it. Um, glancing at the clock and I'm noticing I haven't made it, I barely made it through uh, my first of four fields. So uh, I may have to speed up a bit. I'm going to make the slides available for you so you can take a closer look at all the things I didn't talk about. I want to say, uh, about uh, this, that there, I have some recommendations for places to read about it, if this is interesting. Uh, one of my standard recommendations is Gunnar Carlson's article, Topology and Data from 2009. There's a bunch of books that have appeared already, and I want to emphasize one of them. With the release dates in this coming February, I have written together with Gunnar Carlson an introductory textbook to topological data analysis with a large collection of uh, application case studies uh, to show how topological data analysis actually shows up in concrete applications. Uh, let's see, I have 10 minutes left and three fields to cover. That's not a very... Uh, Mikael, you can you can go a little over. I think this is very flexible here. I think. Okay. Don't. <laughs> I mean, this is this is brilliant. Just all right. Yeah, just, just. Uh, so geometric data analysis is the next thing I wanted to talk about at least a little bit, and it's a topic that has been used for different uh, things through the years. So there's a field of study that emerged in the '60s in France, uh, originating in. A pair of papers, uh, Analyse de Donnet and Analyse de Correspondance, where principal component analysis is used and is generalized to handle categorical data. And the thing that makes it geometric is that uh, all data gets interpreted as point clouds. And it's a field full of drawing graphs of things distributed in the plane and talking about how they're close or far away in these graphs. Another uh, approach that merits the name uh, comes, uh, starts with Kendall in the 1980s, constructing shape manifolds and uh, using something called the Procrustes method, where you pick uh, landmark points on shapes and try to align those uh, by allowing yourself rotations, translations, and rescalings. You define shapes to mean equivalence classes under these operations. So if you're skewing something, then you're changing the shape. But if you're moving it around or shrinking it or growing it, that's not really influencing what shape it is. And that motivates developing a notion of statistics uh, that doesn't use vector space operations. And I'll show you a little bit of what that means in a moment. And then finally, I also want to use geometric data analysis to describe an emergent field of manifold learning where you fit a manifold uh, to an observed point cloud, no longer just fitting uh, lines or polynomial equations, but getting something more, more geometric and getting a more geometric description. And so the, here we find things like isomap or TSME or UMAP as examples of ways to do manifold learning on arbitrary data. So here's uh, Ken, uh, Kendall's idea that 
Shapes are represented by K landmark points. You put out points on your shape that sit at features that you can recognize. And then you try to decide when these collections of landmark points are uh, similar or not. And because uh, of, of this view of shapes, you want to caution out by translation, scaling, and rotation. And this puts you in the end in a complex projective space of dimension K minus two, which we define to be uh, the shape manifold sigma k2. In general, the uh, arrangement of k points in d dimensions would give rise to a shape manifold sigma kd. And by studying the geometry in these manifolds, we can get closer to studying the shapes themselves. So um, a set of k points in the plane are described by, uh, can be described by k complex numbers, one complex number for each point. And so if you quotient out by, uh, quotienting out by translation is easy. That's a linear uh, operation. So that's just lowering a, by a dimension. Quotienting out by scale and rotation uh, needs you to uh, recognize that scale and rotation both can be represented by uh, complex scalar multiplication because uh, any, a uh, complex number can be represented by a radius and an angle. And multiplying such a complex number by a different complex number corresponds to rescaling by R and rotating by theta. And so uh, in order to quotient out by scale and rotation, we want to quotient out by the actual multiplying by the same scaling and rotation for each of the K points. And so that amounts to saying that uh, Z1, Z2 to Zk should be equal to Wz1, Wz2 up to Wzk, which we can recognize as being uh, quotienting out by scalar multiplication, which again, we recognize as giving rise to projective manifolds. Um, uh, where no longer are we caring about the point itself, we're caring about the line that a point is situated on. And that's exactly how we define projective manifolds. So that's how we end up coming to the uh, CPK minus two. We're losing one dimension uh, to translation and then one more dimension by, uh, go, by, by, by doing this uh, projective space quotient. It turns out, for instance, that the space of triangles will form a sphere, a sphere of radius one half, if you want an isometric shape, where the distance between triangles in this sense is represented by geodesic distances on the manifold you're studying. And you do this by placing the first two vertices of the triangle at plus and minus one on the real axis. Then the third point placement gives you the structure of the sphere by augmenting the complex plane by a point at infinity, which represents the case when the first two points coincide. In that case, you can't place them at different points in the plane because they coincide. And so the figure ends up looking like this. I ended up writing all over uh, where it's at, but this uh, figure here to the left looks at this shape manifold from the North Pole. So at the North Pole, we have an equilateral triangle and then as we go out towards the equator, the triangles become thinner and thinner. And the direction we go out dictates how skew uh, the triangles end up being. Until we at the uh, equator end up with straight lines. And below the equator, we have upside down triangles. So cases where you have uh, the third point sitting below the first two points. When we don't have access to arithmetic, we can't define means uh, the way we're used to. The solution to that, uh, in order to allow us to build a geometric sense of uh, statistics, is to use the fact that the mean is the point that minimizes the aggregated square distances. Uh, median is the uh, thing that minimizes the aggregated absolute values of distances. And by translating this over to a setting where we don't have more than distances allows us to give a new definition of means. 
So we define uh, Frechet variance to be the aggregated square distances on the point to all the data points. And we'd, if there is a global minimum uh, to this Frechet variance, we call that the Frechet mean. It might not uh, exist. It might, uh, it might not be unique. And so if we only can find local minima of this, we call those the Karcher means. And we can reconstruct a wide family of well-known notions of means or centroids this way uh, by picking what distance we use. And this definition only really depends on having a notion of distance. So it's something we can apply when we don't have access to uh, more traditionally familiar uh, operations when we're no longer allowed to add or subtract things, but only allowed to measure the distance between things. Uh, manifold learning is, is about uh, learning structures uh, in terms of their geodesic distances. When you embed a manifold uh, in a Euclidean space, ambient distance and geodesic distance might be very different. So one example of that comes in the Swiss roll type of data set where you roll up a plane so that points on the inside of the roll might end up being closer to points on outside layers of the roll than, is, than should be motivated. And so many manifold learning techniques uh, are trying to avoid uh, relying on ambient distances and trying to learn what uh, geodesic distance would look like. And they often do that by learning a nearest neighbor graph and then using some notion of graph distance as a proxy for the geodesic distance. And so Laplacian eigenmaps, you use eigenmaps of the graph Laplacian on this nearest neighborhood graph to produce coordinates. Isomap uses multidimensional scaling on uh, these graph distances. Locally linear embeddings like we see here uh, on the left, uh, the lower two. Uh, graphs are versions of locally linear embeddings. There you pick out barycentric coordinates for each point based on its neighbors. So you express each point as a linear combination of its neighbors. And then you introduce a cost function measuring re reconstruction error and you minimize that with an eigenvalue computation. Uh, there are some software packages that are worth looking at. Uh, the most mature of these uh, would be scikit-learn and GDA tools, where GDA tools does this French old school uh, geometric data analysis. And scikit-learn has support for a bunch of uh, manifold learning techniques. Geomstats is a relatively new player, but it has a lot of support for working with manifolds. And Keops for kernel operations and geomloss are new packages in PyTorch that combine geometric methods and manifolds with deep learning platforms. <clears throat> For information geometry, uh, the, the object of interest are parametrized families of uh, probability distributions. So a lot of classical statistics comes down to estimating parameters for a particular parametrized family. So uniform distributions are parametrized by the interval they act on. Normal distributions are parametrized by means and standard deviations or means and variances. Exponential distributions are parametrized by rates or means. Bernoulli distribution by a probability, and a binomial by a number of uh, trials and uh, success probability. And so in statistical estimation, we're trying to choose appropriate parameters given observed data and given a choice of a family. So you pick what family you believe might be relevant. And then you uh, try to adapt the parameters of that family to the data that you've observed. And these parameters all form uh, manifolds, or at least manifolds with boundaries. So for the uniform uh, distribution, uh, this is actually wrong. Uh, what we get is a half space of uh, R square, namely the, uh, the space where the first coordinate is 
smaller than the second coordinate. So I think that makes it this space, this half space uh, that parameterizes all possible legal choices of upper and lower endpoints uh, for a uniform distribution. The normal distribution, we have the half space uh, R cross uh, R plus, the non-negative half of R, um, part of R, because uh, standard deviations and variances cannot be negative, whereas mean can be anything. Uh, the exponential distribution also takes a positive, uh, non-negative rate. Bernoulli distribution takes a probability within the range 0, 1. And for the binomial distribution, we have one uh, copy of zero, 0 to 1 for each possible choice of a count of number of trials. So we get n times 0, 1, a comb of infinitely many unit intervals. It turns out that manifolds whose points are probability distributions form a very special class of manifolds. So we can call them statistical manifolds. And it would be interesting for a metric uh, on a parameter manifold to measure distinguishability. If we add an infinitesimal to our parameters, we want a metric that compares the two resulting distributions that measures how different the distributions are from one another. An obvious choice for what to do is to just write, the, write out the definition of a derivative, but in terms of what function we're looking at here, the, uh, probability density, depending on uh, the parameters, and um, call that the relative difference. So maybe we can just accumulate, uh, take an expected relative difference. That seems like a good thing to do. Just take whatever we have and put a take an expected value, but that vanishes. So that ends up not being a great uh, notion of distance. One thing that works, however, is taking the variance. We define a metric on uh, the parameter manifolds as the variance of the relative difference. And this ends up reco uh, recovering the Fisher information matrix, which has been um, used in statistics for well over 100 years now, uh, as the Riemannian metric tensor uh, for this particular metric. And this uh, inf uh, Fisher information matrix has exactly these uh, partial derivatives of uh, the log of the uh, probability density as the entries uh, in uh, the Fisher information matrix. It shows up a lot uh, in classical statistics. And it's a theory, Chentsev's uh, theorem, uh, that uh, the Fisher information metric is the only Riemannian metric up to scaling uh, that is going to be invariant under Markov mappings, where a Markov mapping is a pretty natural thing to want uh, invariance for when you're doing statistics. Uh, so, so the easiest way to describe it is to uh, give an example. Suppose I have a six-sided die where three of the sides have probability theta over three, and three of the sides have one minus theta over three as probabilities. So I can draw this die, and that's an outcome in a multinomial uh, sample, uh, because I have six different probabilities in play. But I can also aggregate the outcomes and separate low from high. And that way, I can simulate a weighted coin using my weighted die. And this reinterpretation, if I do that, if I take this reinterpretation to what happens with the parameters, it gives me an embedding of the parameter manifold for the binomial distribution into the parameter manifold of the multinomial distribution. And this type of embedding is a mark of mapping. And we want this type of reinterpretation of things to be something that we can do. Uh, and so we want the metric that we put on these uh, probability distributions to be invariant under these mappings. And Chenzo's theorem tells us that if that's desirable, then on this entire family of uh, manifolds, the only metric uh, that allows us to move between manifolds this way 
and retain the metric uh, is going to be the Fisher information metric. So what we had here is the only thing we need to care about if we're trying to do uh, study parameter manifolds and statistics. I'm gonna skip this example uh, because I'm already over time and it's also not something I know very well. I'm going to point out that uh, there's a lot more that you can do once you have a metric in place and a lot more people do do with this metric. Uh, people study geodesics of the fission information metric, normal projections, parallel transport, code variance derivatives, connections, curvature, anything that pops out of differential geometry is fair game to throw at the Fisher information metric and see whether it says something interesting about statistics. One example of what pops out is that the Fisher information metric itself is a curvature measure, of, namely of the kullback leibler divergence, which is in common use in statistics and uh, machine learning. A couple of uh, things that make me really enthusiastic about it have shown up lately in uh, the uh, journal Entropy. And that show that you can actually construct a topological space such that Shannon entropy shows up as the only uh, degree one cohomology function uh, in that particular, particular construction. So the Shannon entropy function shows up in a relatively natural way from using homological tools to study uh, study the behavior of uh, spaces that are motivated by probabilistic constructions. And the same thing sh shows up from operant theory as well. If homological algebra and operant theory are unfamiliar to you, don't worry, they won't, won't return once I leave this slide. Uh, but it sh Shannon entropy also shows up as a very natural thing to study once you settle on an operant of topological synthesis. Uh, then the Shannon entropy shows up uh, as derivations of that operand. I don't understand the proof yet myself. So no, I can't describe, describe this simply. Uh, the homological algebra thing, they construct a particular topological space out of uh, probability distributions, I think. And then they compute cohomology, and that's about the level at, at which I understand this. I find it exciting, but also slightly incomprehensible at this point. I wrote this section uh, drawing a lot from Katicha's uh, paper, The Basics of Information Geometry. And the canonical reference book would be Methods of Information Geometry. Algebraic statistics, the last section. Uh, in algebraic statistics in a single sentence is the application of algebraic geometry to problems in statistics and probability. And algebraic geometry and uh, algebra in general have a long uh, history of being applied in statistics. But this particular interpretation of using algebraic geometry specifically uh, hails back to uh, starting in 1998 when Diaconis, Percy Diaconis and Bernd Sturmfels uh, released a book studying how random walks and contingency tables uh, correspond to generating sets of toric ideals so they can connect up uh, toric algebraic geometry with conditional inference. And a sequence of books have shown up since then, uh, one that does experimental design using Grevner basis. You can set up your requirements for the experimental design as equations. They tend to be polynomial equations. And doing Grevner basis computations on those can give you solution sets to the constraints in your experimental design, which corresponds to getting experimental designs themselves. Uh, Pachter and Stormfels have written a book about applying it in computational biology, specifically to sequence alignment problems. Studeni studies combinatorics of conditional independent structures. Uh, Okehara and Takamura studies Markov bases. Tvirnik studies tree models using real algebraic geometry. And there are two books out 
that give overviews of the field. One is by Dritzen, Sturmfels, and Sullivan. The most recent comes from Sullivan as a sole author. Um, and this example uh, draws from uh, Sullivan's book. Uh, a Markov chain is a sequence of random variables where the state of the next random variable only depends on its immediate predecessor. So suppose we're just drawing three things. We have a sequence of length three, and our state space is zero, one. So everything is just two outcomes. Then the selection of uh, probabilities of all the eight possible outcome sequences, the joint probabilities, uh, describe this uh, system completely. And they correspond to a point in eight-dimensional space by just accumulating up the probability values. I write R8 here, but really it's on the simplex span by the unit vectors in R8. <clears throat> Conditional probabilities turn out to be uh, easy to describe ratios of these things. And so if we gather up all the conditional probabilities for X3, uh, the only place where the Markov condition comes into play, and simplify it, we end up being able to characterize these Markov chains by uh, one uh, polynomial inequality and three polynomial equations. So that defines a semi-algebraic set, a component of a variety in uh, R8. So that unlocks the, uh, uh, the field of uh, algebraic geometry as a toolkit to study these things. Some of the key things that goes on in algebraic statistics are that uh, very often statistical models show up as these semi-algebraic sets. Very often uh, parametric models are polynomial functions of the parameters, or at least we can choose parameters such that the statistical models are polynomial functions. You might have exponentials showing up uh, in many of the formulas, but you can sort of fit around with exponentials and logs to hide those as uh, parameters themselves and get in the end a polynomial expression for the thing that you're uh, looking at. An estimation and model fitting will tend to find correspond to finding points on these varieties that represent statistical models. And hypothesis testing will correspond to checking whether or not a point seems to be on a particular variety. And just as a very quick blaze through, I've been uh, recently getting more and more interested in categorical uh, statistics, not in the sense of categorical data, but in the sense of category theory. So the idea here is to enable a calculus of string diagrams. And you do that by creating a symmetric monoidal category. So a category that has some way of putting two things next to each other in such a way that you can easily uh, com uh, commute them and um, that has a particular set of uh, expressivity. Uh, one such example would take uh, Borel spaces as objects of the category, take measurable Markov kernels as your morphisms. They compose by uh, integrating over all possible midpoints and just taking products of measurable spaces as this uh, monoidal structure, the thing that puts things together. And if we do that, uh, we, we can start looking at uh, things like saying that uh, building abstract models for statistical theories, for instance. So if we have a small Markov category, basically just a graph uh, of this that has a distinguished morphism, uh, we we'll call the sampling morphism that represents how to do some sampling in that model. Then we get an abstract description of statistical theory. And we can say that a model of that is going to correspond to taking a functor to a Markov category of statistical spaces, something like uh, this Borel uh, space category, but slightly richer than that. And the, that allows us to do things like, instead of talking about a linear model with some design matrix and some sampling distribution, some parameters, we can capture all of that in a figure like this, where we have boxes that correspond to various transformations, like uh, our observations or design matrix X will transform uh, the parameters of the linear model into a mean that we can feed into the normal uh, 
distribution sampler. And this gets really attractive when you start uh, and picking a model of this theory amounts to picking concrete uh, spaces everywhere and concrete transformations everywhere. So filling in all the symbols to the left with actual choices to the right is how we build a model of a statistical theory. And where it gets really cool is when you start getting relationships between models. So if I want to do a general linear model instead, well, that means I need to introduce an, a link function. Uh, and that link function is really just an extra box in this little graph that we shove between the normal distribution and the data. And that gives us a full description of the uh, general linear model. And noticing that we can move between uh, this graph and this graph by making the vector space eta the same as the vector space mu and making h the identity uh, amounts to giving us a map from this graph to the graph of a linear model, which induces a model mi migration functor that goes the other way that takes linear models and reinterprets them as general linear models. This is a very new uh, area of study, uh, but it generates a whole bunch of really exciting work. Uh, one of the main areas to find uh, things that draw on this formalism, sorry, JL, uh, is in CatLab, uh, which is a Julia package for doing computations with this sort of category theore uh, theoretical formalism with these sorts of uh, string diagrams as your primitives, where you draw diagrams and you con connect them by connecting in arrows to out arrows, and that gives you larger diagrams that describe larger systems. Thank you very much for listening and for your attention and for allowing me to go over by 20 minutes. Uh, I hope I haven't uh, been too much of a strain on you, and I'm uh, willing to take any questions that you have. I do have one item of advertising I want to include in this uh, thank you slide. We are releasing a book this winter, and uh, I'm including the book uh, URL here where you go to buy it, and also the uh, release discount code if you want 20% off. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, really. <laughs> So many ideas. Well, first, a uh, round of virtual applause for Mikael. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, questions? So, I TNG wants to see the uh, information theory. Let's see if I can somehow effectively. Let's throw those off. They were kind of messy. So information theory references were this slide. There we go. Uh, I think the talks will be on the ITS website once they're released on YouTube. Just to answer one of the questions in the chat. Uh, as for further resources to learn more about TDA, I uh, there's a there there are many of them uh, out there. Uh, I don't really have a list off the top of my head uh, of specific resources to share in general, other than the ones I listed. Topology and data is a great uh, first contact, and. Uh, our book, I believe, is a great uh, textbook length uh, introduction about it. I do run a community uh, aggregation site at appliedtopology.org, where uh, primarily links to events uh, in the field get shared. But we also have a large list of active researchers in the field with links to their respective homepages. Um, I think we might somewhere have uh, literature links there. 
but I would really would like to know more about uh, your background and motivation in order to give you good pointers to where to go because people are going in so many different directions with this that I can give much better recommendations if I know a little bit more about what makes you interested and what about TDA you would like to learn more about. Uh, if I can answer that, uh, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist and uh, I work with large amounts of neural data and I'm very interested in um, methods to find interesting structure in these large data sets where we don't necessarily have a hypothesis going in, but yeah. we are generally interested in what the data looks like. Um, and if there are interesting features in the data that we may not have anticipated going in. Right, uh, there's a bunch of work in that direction going on. I think the one point I want to point you at uh, as a starting point is uh, pretty much everything that happens with Catherine Hess group. Uh, in uh, the Blue Brain Project at uh, EPFL in Lausanne, in Switzerland. Uh, Catherine Hess and her various collaborators are doing a lot of work on things like uh, discovering uh, neural connectivity structures uh, with topological methods and building uh, topological models of uh, neuron connectivity of uh, neuron uh, morphology. They have a whole bunch of work uh, on using new approaches where they create something they call directed uh, simplicial complexes to study uh, connectivity networks uh, better. So that would be an excellent uh, start point to look at uh, the past five to 10 years worth of output from Catherine Hess uh, work group. Uh, for inroads into how TDA gets applied in neuroscience. We have not figured out a good uh, meaning of the torsion element in persistent homology. Uh, torsion ends up having two slightly different meanings here as well. Usually, uh, I'm, I'm assuming now that you're uh, talking about torsion the way it shows up in integer homology, where it represents things like uh, non-orientability of a, of a surface or uh, things like that. And I don't think we've found anything, any interesting way to interpret that. Uh, the fact that uh, persistent homology features go away when they get filled in shows up as uh, what could also be called a torsion feature in uh, in the uh, algebraic uh, analysis, the way that we break down persistent homology into uh, barcodes, break it down to these start and end times for each feature, the end times can be interpreted as a type of torsion. And that torsion uh, really just means that a topological feature got so heavily connected that it's no longer representing a topological feature. Other questions? Hey, Tobias, can I ask one out loud? Please. OK. Um, great talk. Thank you. Um, yeah. I was wondering, so what we have to deal with a lot of time in practice in data science is leading up to a model, there's a whole series of steps of data processing. Yeah. Um, and it strikes me that when you're doing these uh, models of statistical models as categories, yeah, in the yeah. categorical statistics part, that um, you could easily extend this to include all of the processing of the data that comes from the raw form uh, through to the finalized prediction or whatever the output is. And I, I'm just curious if within the group of people working on that now, do they just want to understand uh, statistical models or do they want to um, use this as a way to organize software in practice? So I think definitely uh, the goal is to have a holistic organization principle based on category that you really can capture the flow of data fr from initial collection to statistical conclusion. Uh, because just like you're saying, every, every transformation can be represented by putting in another box in the diagram. 
Um, so the ambition definitely is to model the entire thing. I know there's a lot of work uh, going on in CatLab on things like uh, representing databases <clears throat> by uh, formalizing a theory of databases and then forming instances of that. I've seen a couple of really interesting blog posts that uh, take take the category theory approach to creating relational databases. Thanks. Yeah, that sounds really promising. Organizing that stuff in practice is really hard. Yep. If I just may back, go back for one second to the topological data analysis. Um, you might have mentioned this, but just if I just want to play with this a little bit, yeah. <laughs> data science question, yeah. are there any Python libraries or packages that I can get just, you know, later, later in the evening, <laughs> start? I'm so glad getting, you are. Getting my hands dirty. And <laughs> uh, uh, the short answer is yes. And um, that's a little bit too short. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit longer answer once I remind myself what the names I want to uh, state are. So there's a meta package called scikit TDA that packages a lot of uh, topological data analysis tools. And that's one of my uh, most firmly recommended uh, points to stop playing. Uh, yes, I will in a moment. Another one, and this one emerges from uh, the group around Catherine Hess, so the group that does uh, the neuro neuroscience approach, is called Jota TDA. So that's Scikit TDA and Jota TDA. Uh, those would be currently the best points for a Python fluent beginner uh, to start playing around with the field. If you're doing other languages, I have other recommendations. Uh, I'm uh, still responsible for the JavaPlex package, which is a Java-based uh, package for uh, topological data analysis, but it's getting a little bit uh, it hasn't been keeping up with the algorithmic developments in the field. And uh, if you're doing R, uh, like so many statisticians are, there's an excellent package called TDA, uh, plain and simple, that implements a lot of what's going on here quite well. Fantastic. So I guess it's high time for me to uh, yield the screen to our next speaker now. Uh, I think I think we there's a again we we sort of have a break <laughs> for everybody to drive a coffee or anything. Um, thank you so much. Another round of applause for Mikael. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful. And again, a lot of a lot of things to 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 think about, talk about. And I mean, one of the things that I mean I'm really learning here is, um, you know, when. For, for my whole life, you know, I've, I've been sort of looking at all these different fields of mathematics and um, again, myself working mostly <laughs> not only partial differential equations and stochastic systems, but I, you know, I always had a fascination for algebraic number theory and other fields to see that now we are in an age where really all these things are coming together and it's just, yeah, this, this, this amaz amazing combination of everything um it's, it's just really really exciting and fascinating so thank you so much we are taking a short break but then um we'll reconvene at three for for hans talk about causal inference i am really looking forward to this so please stay on uh, again i'll switch off my video for a second but the i leave the room open and then in a few minutes at three i hope you to see you all again thanks again and i'll see you in a little while is a little different um, from the talks that came before. And I'm just really gonna give a Blackboard talk. So um, 
And uh, what and and so therefore it's different, like what I'm trying to convey. Um, so let me try to explain. Um, first of all, it would be useful for me to know um, because I saw there was a lot of there's a lot of expertise in some of the questions previously. Um, so is causal infer like are are many people here in the audience, if you're willing to share, um, pretty familiar with causal inference or, you know, it's kind of a topic. Um, no familiarity, okay. Um, I, no, familiar, okay, some familiarity. I mean, it's an interesting subject. So here's, here's what makes that interesting. You know, causal inference is re deeply related to the question, what is causality, right? And, you know, for example, I was at a, I was at a, um, I was at a conference, a neuroscience conference in, um, in a live conference. Actually, someone, who, the speaker was zoomed in, but it was a live conference. We we're sitting there um, at the um, uh, he, at, about neuroscience. He gave a long talk, and I might get to this at the end because I work in neuroscience. He he complained that there wasn't that there was too much kind of correlational thinking in neuroscience. And you've probably all felt that from even if you have a, if you've been reading the New York Times and you're scientifically minded and you hear about neuroscience, there's this kind of a lot of scientists who are outside the field might even feel uneasy. You probably know what I'm talking about. So he's making that kind of talk, giving a talk like that. But then at the end of it, he said, um, he tried to explain some ideas. Let's, how can we think causally? We should, we're not, our current methods aren't thinking causally. And then he, but he, he had been, he, this speaker had been talking this way for a couple of years in some of these seminars. So it was kind of a known kind of opinion of his. And, um, but at the end he said, well, you know, I've recently started to think, well, maybe we shouldn't be interested in causality. Which I took everyone for a loop because he was like a right angle at the end of the talk. It was a throwaway line he didn't explain. And one of the, one of the, one of the audience members said, it's so odd to say because, you know, as scientists, it seems like that's what we're interested. We're all interested in causality, which so, so that's what's true. I, I think that if I ask you if you've heard of causal inference or ask you what is causality, it sounds like a strange thing to say because if you're a scientist, it seems like you all have thought about, we've all thought about causality. What is causality? Because that's what we're doing. We're trying to, you know, find causes and explain things and stuff like that. Yeah, it doesn't seem like we have a systematic vocabulary and language and mathematical framework for discussing that. Um, because I could say something like, have you heard of causal inference and people might be like, I'm, in, I'm familiar or not familiar. So what I, what I wanna do in this talk is talk about the attempts people have made to create a framework and and then, but 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 I don't want to, you know, give you a lot of definitions and lemmas and all that stuff. So what I the the, the way to do that, as 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 um, as many of you know, is kind of related to our earlier conversation. Is if you're if you're going to present a set of a framework, you should find the simplest, most elementary, but kind of interesting example. Right. That's how you begin. Um, you know, understanding math for some of the people in the audience. That's just what I heard. Rather than the most general setting, you know, where it's it's all worked out, but you just you're kind of at a loss for why it's important, or um, you know, and I think a lot of times we do that because we're scared to show how simple our right, the ideas we're working on are. But but you know what I mean, right? So that's what I want to do. I want to do um, I want to do um, some simple, like meaning I can do all the calculations. We could do them together. Examples of inferring causes. In this sense that I'm talking, there's a new set of ideas where this has come up, uh, and that's that. I think that will fit the classical ideas, um, and so that's so that that's why I'm going to do like a blackboard, and we're just going to go through, write down things, do some calculations. And it's going to be all elementary, you know. If you've had like undergraduate probability, that should be should be enough for what I what I want to talk about. Um, now, why is causal inference come up? Given the fact that it's kind of related to um, what Viviano was talking about. Why, why now? I mean, these like, data science have been around forever. In fact, that was when I, you know, I was trained in statistics, and I was I was familiar of with the people, the, the the group of people who, when the word data science started to emerge, were offended. <laughs> there was a new science called data science, um, 
Because, you know, like, exactly. It's like, is there non-data science? Like, what's the non-data science that everyone thought, of, right? And this is a new idea. Why did it come up though? Because, you know, maybe it just, this flood of data suddenly emerged. You know, there were different hooks to the past. There was kind of some change that happened that kind of, you know, just out of the sociology of science that emerged. I, I think that the same thing is for causal inference, which is that, Scientists have been trying to figure out causes forever. But what has um, made it kind of interesting and, and, and the fact that we, have, we don't have a common language for what we're talking about has become, I think it might be new that we're trying to automate the procedure of identi identifying causes from data. And that is, that trying to do that has, um, has made people kind of search for principles. And so I want to, trying to talk about that today. Um, the, these ele completely elementary examples. So I will start by giving you um, my three elementary examples off the top to try to convince you, to get you interested. And then and let's see if they're, they're, they're not trivial, right? Um, okay, so I've already kind of explained where I'm here. Let's start with one that um, is well known in, um, you know, like if you've taken a statistics class, right? Which is Simpson's paradox. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Simpson's paradox and kind of know about it, um, but I, but some people maybe haven't. So let me just um, start with an example. Um, let's suppose, so, so these are, you know, contingency tables, like little tables of data of, of what happens in, in, uh, in this, we're gonna, the main thing we're gonna be talking about are kind of experimental data, that is something like a randomized control trial and observational data, that is something we have just observed in the world, right? Um, so, uh, so, so Simpson's paradox, let's imagine we have a situation where um, we have a treatment. So we have um, a treated population and an untreated population. Um, and um, so maybe for example, we're giving them a drug. Um, or in this case, let's think of an observational trial. So we're just observing people who are taking a drug and people who are not taking a drug. And maybe let's be dramatic. We'll talk about death sort of survival rates. Okay. so. Um, so we observe in the population, there's a, in the treated population, these are the number of people who die. So the, it's M, um, I'm thinking millions here because I'm not concerned about um, statistical significance. So it's, 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 it's as many um, observations as we need, okay? Um, so we observe that, um, you know, 2 million people uh, survive in the treated population and 4 million people die in, in, the, in the treated population. Among the untreated population, 4 million people recover and 2 million people die, okay? Um, so, we have, so we have treated and untreated. And then we also break it down the same way for men and women, let's say, self-identify, let's not, but what we mean by men and women is they self-identify as men and women, okay? Um, so now the question you might ask yourself if say you're presented with this data is, should you take the drug or not, right? So let's just think about that completely naively. One way to think about that is, um, do you, would you rather be in this row or this row, right? So like, but then that's the, notice that it's not really clear and that's the paradox. That's what's called Simpson's paradox. Why is it not clear? Okay, if you were just looking at this, at this popular, this data about the drug effect, um, which row would you rather be in? Well, you'd rather, I mean, it sounds, seems like you'd rather be in the untreated population, you're more people are recovering. On the other hand, suppose you're a man, which, um, which table would you rather be in? Well, you'd rather be in the treated population, but no one dies there, right? What if you were a woman? 
Um, well, you the same thing actually, right? Because everyone dies in the untreated population. But you know, these data are possible in the sense that if you add these tables together, you get this table, right? So that's the paradox, right? Okay, so now would we normally teach that in, um, in um, you know, in, in an elementary statistics class uh, or something, um, that's, a, it turns out the reason this happens is that, you know, it, this, this is, it's not about causation. It, the question we really wanna ask is, does the drug cause the death or not? So this is, this turns out to be, if you've seen it before and you've heard it before, the uh, correlation is not causation. And you've all heard that, right? <laughs> um, and, but you know, one of the problems is even in statistics, when you're, when you're studying it, um, that's often all you hear about the subject, right? Okay, so correlation, we're explaining you how to find, to do prediction, you know, how to describe data. That's what, that's what the role of probability distributions is. But keep a B as a warning, correlation is not causation. But you know, one of the things we want to talk about today is surely there must be more to say that, than that. So that's what I want to talk about today. Okay, and I'm also going to explain why. Um, this is an example of correlation and not causation. What I mean, for example, is that even though this da data set is mathematically possible in the sense that these two add to this, this could not happen in a randomized control trial. Okay. Um, okay. Now let me. Now let's not. Not that's just. Uh, that's kind of a basic thing, actually. You might have heard about that before. Um, now let's check another example along those lines that's more subtle. And then, then you st you're starting to get a flavor for the, how, where the framework comes into play of how to systematize our thinking about causation. Um, so I, I'll tell another like parable, okay? So um, John takes a drug, say the same, the same drug, Tylenol, um, and he dies. Um, Okay, um, the question is, um, so like as he dies, John takes the dog on drive, dies, and then, um, you know, his family sues the manufacturer. Okay, and the manufacturer has done their, um, you know, their clinical trials on this drug, this batch um, of uh, Tylenol, for example. Um, so, so these are the data the manufacturer has. It says there's in a randomized control trial, um, we're gonna say, you know, Y equals, we're gonna call Y death. And Y prime, you know, not the complement of that. So it's survival. Okay. Um, and then um, we're going to talk about X being the, the event that you take the drug. And X prime, you don't take drug. Um, now I want to, now that, I, th that, so that's kind of classical, um, these, you would think of these as events, right? In, um, in a prob like a probability space. Um, but, I, but to talk about the, to model the randomized control trial, the observational trial, I need some way of talking about, um, the randomized control trial in which it's a little different. Like this X and this Y corresponds to the observational trial, kind of like what we're talking about up here at Simpson Paradox. What happens in the randomized control trial is a little different. It's 
the um, the X here represents the fact that the patient was assigned the drug to take the drug. And the X prime represents that the patient was assigned to, for example, take a placebo. And that assignment was random, right? Um, so that means that in a way, the way to think about it is here, for some reason, the, whatever the patient chose to take the drug, and that could be for all the standard reasons, for example, um, you know, their doctor told them to take it, they saw something in the news, they friend told them, whatever their common knowledge in the world is, they, it's just a fact about this person that they take the drug in this, in, this, in this period of observation. Whereas in this, what's happening is they're being forced to take the drug and we'll assume that that means they took the drug, it's that kind of thing. And so these are different, what's called assignment mechanisms. So um, to, to represent this, I'm gonna, the notation I'm gonna use is um, y sub x. And what that means is that this is the outcome, the y. And the subscript x means um, that they were forced to do the action x. So they were forced to take the drug. They didn't naturally take the drug. So this means, um, what the subject is forced to do, okay? Um, so that means that there's four possibilities, right? You can either, um, you can have the subject um, dies and they were forced to take the drug. You can have the subject doesn't die and they were forced to take the drug. And you can have the subject dies and they were forced not to take the drug. And you can have a subject um, doesn't die and they were forced not to take the drug, right? So this is, so this one, for example, is subject forced not to, take drug in the sense of an RCT and dies, okay? Um, okay, so that, let me just continue the parable now that I have that notation. The, um, the, uh, the manufacturer, the family sues the manufacturer, the manufacturer says, but look, the death rates, the mortality rates for the drugged population and the non-drugged population are negligible. Okay, right? Because in the drugged population, uh, meaning they're forced, they're assigned to take the drug, 16 out of a thousand die versus 14 out of a thousand die in the, in the, in the placebo population. Alyssa, that's, that's a very technical question. So I'm, I was trying to introduce, I'm gonna to try to introduce causal inference um, more broadly. So it's not gonna be, um, it's, not, it's not gonna be either. In fact, both of those frameworks are gonna come up. I, I, want, to, I want you to think of them as equivalent to move. To move. Yeah, I'm answering a question in the chat. Um, but I, I'm trying to just give you the non-trivial examples and show you why the subject's interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, let's return to that at the end. Um, okay, so um, so the subject's forced not to take the drug, um, and so where am I? Oh, okay, so the, so the manufacturer um, says, well, the death rates are small. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. I actually, I don't want you to worry about statistical significance again. So these could be, the units of people here could be as big as possible. So I'm not saying the death rates are the same here. However, in the, in, in the spirit of the parable, we might imagine that the manufacturer says, these death rates are very, there's a very small difference and up to the resolution of the law, we're not, we're not liable, right? The law is not teasing apart these kinds of difference in death rates and assigning manufacturer liability. Um, okay, so that's the story. But then the lawyer for, for John's family comes back and says, but you know, that's not what we wanna know. What we want to know is something else. What we want to know is, we know that John took the drug 
and died, right? What we want to know is if he hadn't taken the drug, would he have lived, right? So what we like to do is we'd like to go back, repeat history, force him not to take the drug because it's a fact that he takes the drug and then ask whether he would have then lived. That's what it means for the drug company to be liable, meaning they caused the drug caused the death. Okay. So now that sounds like, you know, we can't do that, right? We can't go back and repeat history and see what happened to John, right? So it sounds like um, some kind of mystical quantity, it's irrelevant. Uh, but at least we could write it down with our notation, right? What we're interested in is um, the probability um, in fact, let me. The probability, um, given that John took the drug and he died, that he would have lived if forced not to take the drug. Right? That's the probability of necessity. That is the probability that the drug is a necessary cause of the death, right? Okay. So what I wanted to point out was, um, in, 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 the, in the spirit of non-trivial examples, it actually turns out that with this data, you can get your hands on this probability. And it's in this case, it's going to turn out to be one, I mean, or in other words, arbitrarily high, putting aside again significance. So that sounds interesting, right? Because we're talking about probabilities of events we could never possibly observe, right? We could never possibly observe this counterfactual event, which is what would have happened if, if we went back and flipped the you know, the, the like world history or something like that. Yet that does seem to be closer to what we're talking about with causality, right? Um, no, X, so X, Y, and, and Y sub X mean different things. So, th so, so let me just review that. I'll go over it again. I'll go over it again when I unpack these examples. I'm just giving you the examples of the front. So like, but, but what I'm saying is Y is death and Y prime is survival. So you think of those as events in some probability space, right? X is you take the drug or X prime doesn't take the drug. What I mean by that, I mean, it's a fact. So, you, so you're thinking if you're randomly choosing a person, like in this case, it's gonna be John. And the question is, do they die or do they survive? That's Y or Y prime. And then do they take the drug or they don't take the drug? That's, that's in the natural world. It's a fact about this person in the world he's living in that he takes the drug, okay? That could be, there could be lots of reasons for that fact. You know, his beliefs, who his friends are, who his family is, who his doctor, you know, all that stuff I talked about. What television programs he watched. But that's not, that's different than um, the randomized control trial where I, regardless of that fact, I force him to take the drug or not. And so Y sub X, that's the event that, regardless of his natural propensity, I force him to take the drug and then he dies. So X and Y, that means he takes the drug in the natural world and then he dies in that situation. This represents if I had forced him not to date the drug, he would have lived. So those are different. Um, well, listen, your questions are much more advanced <laughs> than what I'm trying to do. So, um, I'm, so, so think of this as an exercise in explaining these issues. And then um, we can, I think some of the bigger issues will come up. Um, but I want to show you using, um, no, I'm, no, in this case, um, I'm not going to talk about a causal, like a structural causal model. I'm just going to talk about, well, there is a ca causal model. Um, it's This one can be done, I want to do it in the Rubin framework. So it's potential outcomes. Um, okay, so uh, 
And then the third example, this is, this is a famous tweet. <laughs> and this co comes back to some of the things that uh, Liliana was talking about, of Jeffrey Hinton, that you know you can see there were a lot, caused a lot of discussion, and I don't remember the date. It's not here, it's like, yeah, it's a year ago or something. Um, suppose you have cancer, and you have to choose between a black box AI surgeon that can explain how it works and has a cure rate of 90% and a human surgeon with 80% cure rate, right? So that's, now if you think about everything I just talked about, those are basically, observ that's observational data, right? Um, um, and then the question is, you know, do you want, what, this is, he's asking a broader question. Should we give people the choice to use the, this AI surgeon. But really the, the ultimate question that people are, people are gonna be interested in is, um, you know, should you use, if you, for example, fit a procedure um, and then get a prediction rate based on that procedure, does that mean you should, um, when you intervene, you're gonna get the same effect, right? Um, this is an intervention. And this is the, na the natural, like correlation between X and Y would be the natural thing. So we, so anyway, th this, is, this is slightly different, but it's something I wanna talk about, which is the difference between seeing and doing in, in, in terms of what Judea Pearl talks about. Um, but anyway, um, if I've been clear so far, any questions about this setup? Okay. Um, okay, so let me start with Simpson's paradox. Okay, so so what? So the idea here is the framework we want to talk about is, and it's true for both kind of Rubin and Pearl in terms of the names we've already mentioned. Um, is this is the system is is counterfact? You want to somehow model counterfactuals, okay? Um, so that is you want to you want to model not just kind of what happens, but what would have happened, you know, if situa the, his situation had been different. That's what um, Donald Rubin and um, and Jersey Neiman much uh, much far much longer ago um, called potential outcomes but I want to map that onto this question of counterfactuals okay so that, so you want to model what would have happened if okay so so here's some here's some notation I'm going to change the notation a little bit because um, it, certain things are more natural in, in one notation than another so um, so you have this kind of person right and um, we're going to call this the um, the, the, the random variable D, the event that there's no drug. When, sorry, random variable D, when that's zero, that event is the event that there's no drug. And um, D equals one is the event that they take the drug, right? Okay, so D is the random variable indicating whether they take the drug or not. Um, and then O sub ND, that's the outcome if they're, if they don't take the drug or they're forced not to take the drug. It's the outcome when they, upon not taking the drug. So, so this is the outcome. Um, if does not take the drug. And let's take, think of that as binary. Um, and then this is the outcome. O sub D is the outcome if they do take the drug. Does take the drug. Okay, and the outcome is zero or one, say zero or one binary outcome. So zero would be um, dying. And one would be surviving. Okay. 
And then um, y is um, the observed outcome. There, there's there's going to be an assumption I'm going to making in here, which is, or best we'll state it now, which is that um, whatever the the impact of the drug is, it's the same if the person takes the drug, or if they're assigned to take the drug. Right, that's kind of an assumption in an RCT. Right. Um, okay, so then what what does that mean? So that means that you can think of y as O sub you know, the random variable D. That is, the, the outcome Y is gonna be O sub N D. It's the outcome upon not taking the drug if D equals zero. And it's gonna be O sub D if, um, it's gonna be is gonna be outcome if D equals one. So that determines the observed outcome, Y. Then um, like, as I said, the, the, the outcomes for Y are binary. Okay. So O sub N D, that O sub, um, O, D, o, D, o sub D and O sub N D, that's a fact about the person. What happens when they take the drug? What happens when they don't take the drug, right? So that means there's two variables. There's four kinds of people, basically, right? You have the, um, you have the people who survive whether they take the drug or not, right? Those are survivors. I mean, that the point there is that the drug has no impact on them, right? Whether they take the drug or not, they're going to live. So this, they, 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 it, the drug has no cause. That's what we mean by that, the drug has no causal impact, right? Uh, then there's like the doomed people, right? They're just going to die. They're going to die regardless of whether they took the drug or not, right? So the, the question, you know, that you're interested in is in the population that you're applying this drug to, like so think about the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. What, what you wanna know is, you know, the survivors and the doomed are irrelevant. What you wanna know is, are there, is the proportion of responders, that is the people who die when they don't take the drug and live when they take it, is that greater than the proportion of anti-responders? That those people that they, they'll, they'll um, They'll live when they don't take the drug, and the, um, the when they'll die when they do. So basically, here the drug is killing them. The um, here the um, the drug is you know saving them, and here the drugs are relevant. So the causal inference problem is estimating the size of this population and this population. And you see the problem is that you never observe both of these for any one person. Um, okay, so so then we're interested in um, what I just said, the survival probability, if you were to treat everybody, that's expected value of O sub D, right? So O sub D is binary. So if I just force everyone to take the drug, how many would live? What proportion of the population would live? Minus, if I force everyone not to take the drug, what proportion would live? And you, if that's greater than zero, then that's basically an argument for giving the drug, right? And so let's call that the average causal effect. Okay. Um, and then here's the point. This is the causation is not correlation, is that that's different than this, which is, among in an observational trial, among the people that take the drug, what's the survival probability? Minus what, among people that don't take the drug, what's the survival probability? Okay. Um, okay. So the so my point in um, in so this is all I mean by the framework. It's just that let's assign let's put the observed, observable events and the counterfactual events into the sample space and put the probability distribution on all of it. Um, and that's enough. I mean, that's the basic, that idea is enough um, to um, explain Simpson's paradox, for example. 
today. So, um, so first observation is that's why we do RCTs. So this is kind of familiar to everyone, is that if we randomly assign um, the treatments to people, um, then, um, then theta is equal to alpha. The call, average causal effect is the associational effect. That's what we, that's our, I mean, that should be everyone's intuition. That's why we do randomized control trials, going back to the beginning of, um, you know, experimental design. Um, okay, so let's just see that because it's, you know, it's a very, one, um, one argument for thinking this way is that that explanation is very clean. See now, so let's so so so. What does um what does randomly assign mean? Okay, it means that D, the the um, whether someone takes the drug or not is independent of these facts about them. You know whether they're a survivor, whether they're a responder, whether they're anti-responder, whether they're doomed. That's determined by OD and OND, right? So D means like if I flip a coin, that's the assumption that has nothing to do with what I did, right? So then, um, so so theta remembers the is the um, is the the probability of dying for the drug population minus the probability of dying the mortality rate for the non drug population, right? When they when you're forcing them all to take the drug, that's what OD is. What happens to that person when I give them the drug? OND is what happens to them when I don't give the drug? Okay, so since that's independent of D. I can condition on anything that depends on D and that shouldn't change that expectation, All right? So I have the expected value of O sub D given anything about D, for example, the fact that D equals one is the same. Likewise, the expected value of O and D given anything about D, for example, the fact that D equals zero is the same, All right? So this is just, Simple argument. This is where I'm drawing in, um, you know, something like undergraduate probability. So, but, but there's something intuitive, right? That just, when something's independent, so what this represents is the expected value of this given the knowledge of this. So this is the expected value of OD given the knowledge that you took the drug. So it's intuitive that what we mean by independent is that knowledge doesn't change the expectation, right? So this is just by independence. Um, okay, so then let's just work through the implication. That's it. That's the independent. That's the only non. That's the only step of interest, kind of, uh, right? Because what does it mean? So, in the event that the person took the drug, the outcome O sub D is the outcome O sub capital D, right? So this is the same as the expected value of O sub capital D given D equals one. And likewise, um, given the event that they didn't take the drug, the outcome O sub D, the natural outcome, is simply the outcome that they of what happens when they're forced not to take the drug. So this is expected value of O sub capital D given D equals zero. So just to remind you, I'm just the, the, I'm just using these definitions here. Um, okay, and then just, you know, follow the steps. So then, um, so that's what we mean by the natural outcome, why? That's alpha, done. So just by this step, essentially, I've broken, you know, I've decoupled the dependence between theta and alpha. So these just become the same thing. Right? That's our something you're signing either intuitively or, or, or formally already familiar with, I think. Because if you ask yourself, why do we do randomized control trials? That's it, right? 
Okay. Um, okay, so now let's go back to Simpson's paradox and ask ourselves what happened. So remind, let's remind, let me remind you of Simpson's paradox. So the idea is um, we have, this is again, these are contingency tables, what they call contingency tables. Um, and um, and they're telling me basically the mortality rates, right? In this in in an, in an observational trial, and the paradox is that um, you know the the um, the number. Of, if I look at the whole population, the mortality rates for the treated population suggest they're they're uh, lower than for the untreated population. Whereas if I if I break it down into gender. It, there's a reversal that happens, right? Okay. Um, so the, the paradox is when I ask you, which row would you rather be in? What I'm trying to ask you is, you know, is the treatment harmful or not? And then I'm also on the, in the other conditions, you know, I'm asking is the treatment good for men? And I'm asking is the treatment good for women? So, that, so now you kind of see what I'm saying. That's just a false question. Right, because um, that is not the same as which row should you be in. That's the confusion between theta and alpha, right? So the mathematical statement that we're observing is just that we're not looking at the causal effect. We're looking at the the, um, the association. So we're saying in the whole population, the probability of dying given you're treated is greater than the probability of dying given you're not treated. Right, because this is about this is about one third, this is about two thirds. Okay, um, and then I'm saying the probability that you're dying, given the knowledge that you're treated, and a man, on the other hand, is less than the probability of dying, given you're not treated, and a man. And that's obvious because this is zero approximately. Right. Treatment good for women, what we're saying is that um, the same thing, the probability that you're dying given you're treated and um, a woman is less than the probability of dying given you're not treated. and a woman. And that's obvious because this is one, right? So this is the reversal. But, but if you think about it, this is exactly about alpha, right? So the problem is really with this translation. Right. This what we want to know is about theta. Right. Um, okay. For example, this couldn't happen in a randomized control trial. So, um, so for example, let's just think through that a little bit. So, suppose we knew that um, the expected death rate, given the gender, was greater than sorry, the expected death rate for the given the drug population was greater than the expected death rate um, for the non-drug population given some condition. And that was true for all values of the condition, right? Um, well, then you can see right away that that's going to mean that unconditionally the same equality holds, right? So that's just, again, that's just um, something you would be familiar with elementary probability. So expected value of O sub D, let's think about it. That's equal to the sum over all possible Zs of the expected value of OD given uh, Z equals Z, little Z, times the probability Z equal little Z, right? And then by, by this supposition, 
So this is star. This is the sum over z. This is greater than or equal to this. And that's just, that's expected value of um, theta d. So that's impossible. So that I would say summarize, summary of that is there's no paradox. Okay. So is that clear to everyone? Okay. Um, okay, so that's clear, but that's just resolving something you probably already know. And um, just maybe, maybe, you know, Simpson's paradox is worth pausing on. Um, in fact, it's not even clear in the textbooks that that is ultimately about causality that paradox, but this should make it clear, right? And then it also shows you thinking about counterfactuals is useful because it's it's making it very clear what's happening, right? Um, okay, so, um, so now let's return to that other problem. That's, that, that's more subtle, right? Um, which is this, this, this probability that the drug causes the death for John, okay? Now let's do that using the same thinking, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, so let me remind you really quickly. So, I, so the, the, the parable was the following. John took the drug and then he died, right? And the manufacturer said, well, we did the randomized control trial that we were just talking about. And the death rates were negligibly greater for one population than the other. Up to the limits of the law, we're not responsible. The law is not parsing these kinds of distinctions. That's kind of the story. And then the lawyer's coming back saying, that's the wrong probability. The lawyer's saying, I know that um, John took the drug and died. So I have to condition on that. I mean, that's part of my information. I'm, John is not a randomly chosen person. He's a, he's a particular person that took the drug and died. And I really need to know what's the probability that he wouldn't have died if he hadn't taken the drug, given that fact. And that's not what the RCT tells me about, right? So, um, so, the, so to make the notation again, um, you know, so, so, he, so here, I'll go back to the original notation I introduced. So like X equals take the drug, X prime equals not take the drug. That's just a fact about the world and John kind of jointly, right? So this is something you could observe, right? If you just to watch the world. And then this is, this is the event that he dies and he doesn't die, so a, 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 a randomly chosen subject. Um, so, so we have a story like Tylenol, fatal side effects, the kind of picture you want to think about of Tylenol. Um, and then we have the idea, we have a notation for, um, for, the, for the experimental data, which is where you assign the drug, um, you know, for example, as we just talked about randomly to um, some populations and other populations. So then we want to talk about a, a person that we've randomly chosen and then a, that, and the fact that we're going to force them to take the drug. Um, so that's Y sub X. And so X represents, I'll just write it again, X is um, forcing the subject. To take the drug. And this is the outcome. And then you get the four possible events. They're forced to take the drug and they die. They're forced not to take the drug and they die. They're forced to take the drug and they survive. They're forced to take the drug. They're forced not to take the drug and they survive, right? So this one is, uh, let's see. Okay. 
Um, uh, and then the these are the these are the data sets that we have. All right. So same ideas: death, survival. In the randomized control trial RCT, this is uh, whether they're forced to try take the drug, and this is where they're forced not to take the drug. The observational trial, this is again deaths and survivals. This is the fact that they took the drug in the natural world, and this is the fact that they didn't take the drug in the natural world. And then these are the contingency table data you have. Again, these numbers are large. So these might be units of what billions, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, something like that. So we're not worried about significance. There is this effect here, it's just small, right? So the causal effect, so, John, so here the story is, John takes the drug, it dies, that sues the manufacturer. The manufacturer says, look, the causal effect, theta, what is theta here? It's 16 over 1,000 minus 14 over 1,000. That's 0 0.002, that's small. And then uh, the lawyer comes back, for John's lawyer comes back and says, no, I'm interested in PN, uh, that is the probability given the observation that he took the drug and died. What is the likelihood that if he hadn't taken the drug, he would have lived? And that means because it's a fact about it that he takes the drug, this is means would I force him not to take the drug? He would have lived. So that's the probability. We call that PN the probability that this is a necessary cause. Uh, okay, and then this we could translate this into English as the probability that the drug was a necessary cause. Of the death. Okay, so uh, so this is now the sample space, this counterfactual sample space that I introduced for to explain Simpson's paradox, right? Let's think about what what could happen. Uh, so basically, there's eight kinds of people in the world now. Okay, so we went from four to eight, right? So um, there's the uh, the fact about whether they take the drug or not, right? That'll be four kind of people, four, four group that are four, two groups of four, of four. And then there's what happens, you know, when they're forced to take the drug, whether they die or not. Uh, so remember, y equals death here. Uh, and then what happens when they're, uh, with their, well, the, the event that they survive, and then what happens when, they, when they're forced not to take the drug. And so there's, for each of these, there's four possibilities here. So therefore there's eight possibilities, right? I, and then, and then uh, the, that assumption that I talked about, that when I force them to take the drug, and if they naturally choose the drug, the outcome's the same, uh, that's in the background, right? Um, so, but that, will, that means because of that assumption, the natural outcome is determined by all these. Right? So for example, let's make sure you're with me. What's, so for this kind of person, X, Y, Y, what's the natural outcome? Is anyone with me? <laughs> Did I lose you by boredom? <laughs> No one's sure? Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, it's fine. I know it's the end of the day here for a soda. Uh, so let's, so, so my point was that, well, what do we know about this person here? They take the drug. Um, if they were forced to take the drug, they would die. 
if they were forced to take not take the drug, they would die. So what's going to happen when they take the drug? They're going to die. Um, and then, so that so that basically says that the outcomes for all the natural outcomes for all these for these four people will be taken from this column. All right. So this is uh, y prime y y prime, and likewise, the natural outcomes for these kinds of people will be taken from this column. So this would be uh, y y y prime y prime. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay. So we are interested in uh, this PN, right? So let's just write down what, you know, our standard probability thinking. So this is the probability um, of, the, you know, it's the numerator. What is the definition? Of, let's write down the definition of conditional probability. So this is the, the numerator is the probability y prime sub x prime comma x comma y, an unobservable event, right? Divided by the probability of x, y. So the, the model is uh, going to imply that there are these eight kinds of people. And what we're interested in about them is what's their proportion of the world. So we could give that a name, p1, p2, p3, p4. P5, P6, P7, P8, right? So basically, if you think about it, uh, what is the event Y prime sub X prime comma X comma Y? That's this, right? There, it's somebody who, uh, in the natural world, they take the drug and they die. But if they had been forced not to take the drug, they would have lived. That's it. So this is P3. Right. And the PXY, likewise, that's people who take the drug and they live. So that's P1 and P3. So that's right. And remember, so the fundamental problem you can say of causal inference is that you can't you can't get these numbers from anything. Right. For example, uh, in an observational trial, you'll never see these. So that's kind of like hidden data. In an observational trial. Okay. Um, how are we doing? I mean, is this going too slow? Would you rather I speed up and not go through the calculations and show the results? Because I, you can see, I set it up so I could do all this by hand. <laughs> okay. Any feedback about that? It, I think it's it's totally up to you. I mean, I think I think it's great to go through this in detail, but. You decide, okay. uh, I mean, maybe right. at the end, a little bit time for discussion and I'm <laughs> so many things to say yeah, at the right. end, Good. but uh, it's nice all to right. see all these discussions, uh, the calculations definitely. So. Okay, all right, Let, let's just do it. Cause it, well, I mean, my point was that I want you to be able to feel this by the end of it. Um, uh, and then I'll tell you why I think it's interesting. Um, so, um, okay, so we have, so, it's, so let's talk about what we can observe, what we can't observe, okay? So, so we can, so for example, there's information we get from the observational trial and there's information we get from the experimental trial from the randomized control trial, right? Um, so for example, we can get our hands on these three quantities, right? So probability of Y, if you think about it, um, that's the, um, that's just, you know, if I, if, I, if I just went out in the world and observed what the death rates are, right? 
that's going to tell me the proportion of these events all aggregated. So this is the probability, the probability of y is p1 plus p3 plus p5 plus p6, right? Now, the probability of y given x prime, that's what happens. That's the probability of death in the, um, in the experimental trial for the population that was assigned not to take the drug. And you can get that. You can figure out what rows that corresponds to. Um, it's going to be, let's look at this population. Sorry. No, look at this. So look, so look at this row. Which ones uh, survived? It's this, 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 this. Sorry, which ones died? Y equals death. So I get uh, P1 plus P2 plus P5 plus P6. Okay. And then we already talked about this, P1 plus P3. Um, and then what I'm saying is this is from the observational trial. We can observe these from the observational trial. This is from the RCT. This is from the observational trial. <laughs> um, okay, uh, now, Okay, consider the following quantity and don't worry about where I got it from. Um, just as a demonstration, PY minus P sub, PY sub X prime minus divided by PY comma X. Well, we know that. So just based on what we just observed, that's P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P6 minus P1 plus P2 plus P5 plus P6 divided by P1 plus P3. Okay, and then you notice these things are canceling here. So this um, P1, P1, P5, P5, P6, P6. Okay, so then you have um, P3 minus P2 divided by P1 plus P3. Right, so that's a lower bound on what we're interested in because P2 is positive. So that's P3 plus over P1 plus P3. That's, that's the probability of necessity. So we have an observed lower bound on the probability of being a necessary cause. Right, observable if you have both the observational trial and the RCT. Um, okay, now if you go back to the data, um, we can quickly get we can quickly see what it is in this data set. So um, so we have p, p p of the the death rate in the observational trial is thirty over two thousand. Um, then um, the death rate in the um, in the forced the four, the placebo population essentially is 14 over a thousand. And um, the, uh, the prop P of XY, that's from the um, observational trial, that's two over 2000. So if you plug all that in, this is a cooked up example, obviously. Um, but like the, the example I gave for Simpson's paradox, the cooked upness is just to make the calculations easy. Um, the thing is kind of interesting regardless. So it turns out that this is um, 0 0.015. Uh, minus 0 0.014 divided by um, 0 0.001. That's one. <laughs> so we have a lower, but the lower bound is one. The probability it's a necessary cause is one. So that's it. That's so that's that's the um, that's a non-trivial example of causal inference, right? Because 
you're, you cannot observe this thing that we're talking about, right? You can't go back and repeat history, but that's what we mean by causation. But you could combine the data in these two different senses and, um, and get say something about it, at least in this cooked up example. Now, if you're confused about the one part, the way, the way to think about that is, you know, I was saying, don't worry about the significance of this. These are very large numbers. So what I really mean is that you could think of it as that if these were just ratios, as the population got bigger, this gets more and more certain that the drug caused the death, right? So that's, that's just the subtlety. It doesn't really change the conclusion. Okay, um, so let's go back. I mean, I'm, I'm coming near the end, running out of time. So let me just sort of answer some of those first questions. So, um, so let's take the bigger picture here. Um, so uh, the what what I just described um, is this idea of you know basically all I'm doing is I'm putting counterfactuals into the probability space, right? And then you'll see, you're seeing these hidden things are becoming events. Um, so it's kind of like a sensor data problem, a hidden data problem. That's what causal inference ends up being. Um, and so the, the, the people who did that, so, th so this is called the potential outcomes framework. And so that's due to Neiman. Originally, the one of the original that original the original name of the founders of statistics and Donald Rubin. There's another way to look at it, which is one of the questions that Alyssa asked, um, which is, um, you know, it's it's there's a framework where you think about it in terms of graphs. These same ideas. Um, and that's due to uh, Judea Pearl. I mean, it's a, oh, I, maybe I should say, if these are heavily associated with these names, not there's a lot of people that work on these things. Um, and in fact, this cooked up example I got from Pearl, um, but it, um, but um, I did it in the root, in the potential outcome framework, because just, it was so transparent that way. Um, but let me just quickly tell you about Pearl and then, then I'll take a bigger picture of why this is, I'm not probably gonna get to the neuroscience stuff, um, which is what this, um, some, someone asked. Um, so another way to think of these is graphical models. So, so the way to think about it is, um, there's actually everything, there, every, like what I mean, the causal effect is a functional relationship essentially. And what, what a graph represents is, what do I need to determine the value of a certain variable? And that's causal, meaning that if I went in and intervened on a variable, the, those equations would tell me what would happen. Um, so intervention is kind of built into it. So, for, so, the, so, so there's a bigger framework. So, so what I'm trying to say is, that people have thought about these questions. I, I just gave examples, but people try to th have thought about these questions pretty very, very hard and come up with these broader frameworks and then questions about what you can calculate, what you can observe, you know, what quantities are estimable. And I was just trying to show you why they're interesting, but I didn't really give you the framework. Um, other than there's the counterfact, the point of view of the counterfactuals, but there, there wasn't clear like how I came up with the quantities I did and, why the lower bounds were there, et cetera, all that. But you can imagine this is the beginning of thinking about that, right? Well, can, if, if you can't observe these things, the, the, the question is a hidden data problem. Causal inference is a hidden data problem. Is what do I, what can I, based on what I can observe, um, what can I say about what's gonna happen? And there's a big distinction between what you can see and what you can do, right? 
You saw that in the randomized control trial. What the, the, there's an explicit action that changes the probabilities. That's the action of assigning the drug or not. And the, the way the the way that the, the framework that emerges is that, you know, in fact, um, the view that we have in statistics were of probabilities. That's very that's kind of narrow. That there's these underlying mechanisms, right? And that's you know that's why there's this kind of discrepancy in dynamics and statistics. It's the, the people who are thinking about the mechanisms and people are thinking about observable probability distributions. It, there's, the, there's these underlying mechanisms that those are the invariants, right? Like what's happened in, in this example is that these quantities kind of represent the mechanisms. Here they're abstracted away to this. And um, these are different environments. And, but these environments share the mechanisms. But by putting them in different environments, the observed probabilities are different. And the focus on, probab on, on the estimating probability distributions that you get in like statistics, um, it, um, I don't know if it, if it, I mean, for some, this is where things get controversial. Um, um, some people feel it obscures the underlying mechanisms. Um, and, but those, those invariants, that's what causation is. That's how to think it's that. So this is like a toy example of that. Two different environments with the same causal mechanisms, but you need both environments. And what we mean by causation tends to be, you know, what would happen upon a certain action, you know, um, if you think hard about it. Um, and in fact, that tends to be in a way that's confusing, right? If you think about it from point of view of physics, it's more, because, um, there's no, it's hard to talk about the difference between an agent and the rest of the world. The agent is part of the world. So what we mean by causation is we try to separate an agent from the rest of the world. And in that sense, we want to predict what that, what will happen if that agent does something. And that's what we mean by cause and effect or something. And this is like starting to be like examples of that and a framework for that. Um, so, so another example would be something like, so this is very Perlian, as, as someone brought up um, in the chat, um, that what they call structural causal models, um, which is that, you know, you literally have, for example, the way you would think about like this particular model, for example, I would think of you as random, whatever I mean by random, that's something that's, well, that's the whole, the whole question, right? But something I'm willing to model as random in the world is you. And X and Y are maybe these observables, like the treatment and the death. And um, what the, the, there's an underlying causal model means that there are functions that relate all these things. In this case, that's what these hours represent. What this hour represents is that um, in order to determine X, I need to know U. So U is some function of X. That's its only parent in this graph, right? Uh, whereas Y, its two parents are U and X. So that tells me, that's a, a shorthand notion of saying that, that X, that's what F X, of, uh, X represents, is a function of U, whereas Y is a function of X and U. Um, and so if you knew F, and the fx and the fy, and you knew the probability of u, that's the only noise here, then you know everything you want to know. Like you can compute any probability you want. It's kind of like knowing p1 through p8 earlier in the potential outcome framework. Um, so for example, um, back to the Hinton tweet, um, imagine I was just given such a model. This would be like the God's view of the world. This is the world. This is what we mean by causal. It's this thing, and these are the relationships. I'm explicitly specifying them. So, uh, so in this case, I have these particular relationships. I want to go into the details. Um, so, for example, you, that's that's the noise in the world. It might affect all the, it might encode all these things I'm talking about, like what makes a person be likely to take the drug or not, what kind of people there are in the world, what they're going to see, what, you know. 
That's the only noise there is in the world. That's the only randomness in the world. That's where all the probability comes from. And then everything else are these, these mechanisms which are coded by F, which are just deterministic. And so what this tells me, for example, is that um, if I know U, I know X and Y through these equations, right? And so I have a particular probability distribution for U. And um, I have a particular relationship between X and U and between Y and X and U. And I, I happen to write it down here. Well, we won't, we're all getting tired, so I won't do the same um, calculation business. Um, but you can imagine something like these three things being of interest, these three kinds of objects. So this would be, for example, seeing, right? That's these observations. It's, I'm not doing any actions. I'm just observing X and Y, and I want to understand their relationships. That's like alpha earlier, right? And then um, there's doing. So Pearl calls this do, and he has a whole calculus for this called, that's the do calculus that many of you have probably heard of. Um, that's like the intervening, like the randomized control trial, forcing the person to take the drug or not, right? And then there's finally imagining. That's about things you can never do, right? You can't do or see, right? For example, this counterfactual probability about whether John, John, in, the, in the alternative universe, John would have died. Um, so in a model like this, this is the God's eye view. You can compute all these probabilities. And so, and they're gonna de depend, come out of this. They're gonna be certain, like this event is gonna be a ratio of two probabilities involving these sets of outcomes, right? So for example, if you think about it a little bit, you'll see that this one is the probability that U is um, either five or seven, divided the probability that U is either between four and seven. You can kind of see why, because given X equals one, that's the denominator. This is the event that X equals one. And this is the event that y equals one and x equals one. We could go through it, but let me just, just take my word for it. Uh, so it turns out that with this model, I can compute these probabilities. So for example, this is 0.9. This is gonna be 0 0.8. This one is gonna be about 0.89. And this is gonna be about 0.94. Right, this is kind of related to Hinton's, the question about Hinton is that, you might feel like that this is a good predictor of death, whether x equals one or x equals zero, but it could be reversed if you actually do the thing, right? So this, the, this information, just seeing, it doesn't tell you about doing. It's not enough. And similarly, imagining to go even deeper, you know, I could compute these, these ones too, which is, well, I, I won't take you through it, but if we thought a little about it, we could figure out what these are too in terms of these numbers. And they're going to be, so in, in this particular case, it's going to be 0.85 here and 0 0.80 here and 0 0.90 here and 0.98 here. So the observation here is that, in fact, the, in, the advice now you want to imagine you know that, for example, John is a certain kind of person. Do you want him to, do you want to force him to take the drug or not? Well, it might, it might reverse depending on the kind of person John is. Right, the survival rate, this is a reversal. Okay, I, I've um, come to 4.30. It's been a long day. Um, so that my goal was to um, make you think about causality. Um, my my own history was so here's a reference. You know, I grabbed a lot. This I'm not I'm not um, an originator of anything I talked about. Um, and in fact, it's not my main area. I my I, my background is statistics and neuroscience. And I if I had more time, as I mentioned the abstract, what I want to talk about was this these issues that we talked about that people are complaining that neuroscience is correlational. And so a lot of problems, 
these things have come up. And so I took an interest in it. And then, and I, you know, classically trained in probability statistics, I found that I'd heard about these ideas, but I hadn't gotten deeply into them. And I picked up Pearl's book. Um, this is by way of recommendations. And I found I, um, you know, it was just a, a completely fascinating. Um, so, um, Yeah, that was my story. So that was, I guess, that, that was what my goal was to um, get you to think about causality. I found that having done that, I noticed that a lot of discussions, go back to even Viviana's discussions about what is explanation? What, um, you know, what, what is scientific understanding compared to machine learning? Um, they, they, they feel like these concepts are relevant. The proper, the distinction between prediction and causation. And, uh, and so then there's an introduction to these ideas. There are people who have thought deeply about this. Um, and then for, for, if I had 15 more minutes, I would talk about a little bit about how that's showing up in neuroscience. But I think it's true in any field. These things are kind of interesting. All right, that's it. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, thank you so much. You I did. mean, a big round <laughs> of applause for, for Han. Uh, yeah, this, this I, I absolutely i mean these these things are i think as we speak i mean i've seen this it, it came actually up in uh, viviana's talk i think they are so relevant um not only in the sense of what is scientific understanding but also uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh bias and fairness in machine learning these days mm -hmm. yeah all <laughs> these things that comes up what do we mean by directly feeds exactly into, into the and you know it has it has a it has a scientific component in the sense what do the models tell us and are the models actually suited to to identify the scientific yeah. causes but then it also has an ethical component right. what does it mean <laughs> so yeah i mean so so, let me, so 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 that it really did transform my thinking and I, like I said, I can't wait to it. And I'll just give a couple of observations. The newspaper discussions, it transformed my looking at them. What, are they, what, do we, what do we really mean by the, the machine is biased? What I want to know is not like, is a man, being a man a good predictor of whether the job is, if I could go back in time and change their gender, whatever that means, would it change, you know, that's what I want to know. That's different than the association. Or, you know, I observe my kids, really, particularly young kids. I have young kids. You know, probability is very much about frequency. You know, like what's the likelihood of something happening? And that's important, but it's not what they're most concerned about. Like, and even when we talk to each other, we use, you know, Pearl brings this up really, you know, powerfully. Like we use the word why, right? Because, and that is very different than what we're talking about in these prediction problems. And the kids, and they're playing. Like the fact that they want to, you know, the experimental procedure is important. Like what happens when I act is very different than what happens when I see, you know, that. So you just, I just found that I was seeing it everywhere. Uh, absolutely. About it. absolutely. Yeah. And that, it seems to me that this is actually sort of the kind of framework and discussion that, that will help us to avoid the next AI winter. I mean, it yeah. really, it, it, <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. It will really move everything forward right. in particular if you think about i mean i i thought that this was really fascinating and inspiring to to see in reality how we sort of need these unobserved probabilities and we all know what we are doing as humans we have right. models to fill in <laughs> sometimes we are right sometimes we yeah, are no, wrong. We, sometimes we can quantify think our the, uncertainty right. about those probabilities the, the people who are excited about this and we're excited about it 20 years ago we're thinking humans are thinking like i don't you know the some hunter and gatherer was saying wasn't talking about the likelihood of the lion was there it's like given the knowledge that i saw the lion over there which i had never seen before in my life i know he's not there like it's it's all about the implications of like certain counterfactuals right exactly. Um, exactly so they're like that's really important like we talk that way why do we use the word because so much so that's why they got excited. There must be a way to mathematize this. And um, so, yeah, you kind of, you can, you, can, um, you start to, that, that enthusiasm, for me at least, it was a little infectious. Yeah, it does seem convincing. I don't know if this is the right way to think about it, but like, this is important. 
Uh, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, I mean, I think these kind of ideas will go a long way, in particular, if you think that, you know, <laughs> if you if you compare if, if you compare like machine learning to, again, the way we observe as humans, as we are learning and somehow our brain is learning is there is this this magic thing that we can actually learn from much less data points. So, <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, that's, that's, these kind that's, of ideas. I think it's all related. Yeah, it's all that's related. A yeah. Huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Alyssa, please. Yeah. Alyssa yes, was hello, one of the experts in the audience. Yeah. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, perfect. Uh, so um, I have always um, kind of been uncertain about the Rubin framework because it seems like you're taking um statistical averages and then trying to apply them to individuals um and while the the perlian way of going about this is a little more a, a lot more prohibitive because how in the world do you actually get a causal model in real life <laughs> you basically don't um yeah i guess what are your um uh, in at least in the in the perlian framework it's clear how um, how we are applying that to the individual. So basically it's uh, pretty similar to saying like, oh, I know how the world works and I know stuff about this person. So given the stuff I know about this person, uh, I can just look at the model and it'll spit out what would have happened to them. Whereas in the Rubin framework, you're looking at basically statistical averages. So how is that? Um, it, it seems like fancy statistics rather than uh, causality, um, like for real so i th so um uh my sense and again i'm trying to um i'm conveying what i've gathered i don't want to i don't want to portray myself as um an originator here um but my sense is that those frameworks are the equivalent meaning that you could transfer um a th like any theorem you could state in one you could state in the other so that's not that's, there's a couple of things to say, that's one. I think Pearl argues that um, in practice, the assumptions, the, the whole issue is what assumptions, like the whole question is what assumptions you have to make in practice, right? Uh, I think Pearl has argued that the assumptions, like the kind of independence assumptions that are needed, they're like this ignorability, or so, if you've heard these phrases, in practice are, very di are not the natural ones that scientists have for Rubin, the, the kind of things that come up. Um, that's one. The other thing is they're both idealizations because, because there's a hidden data problem. Like the, the point is, yes, you're not going to observe in any, in either of them, you're not going to, so in either of these cases, you're not going to observe P1 through P8. That's the full causal model here, kind of, right? And you're not going to observe all of F and, um, you know, all of, basically all of F and P and P. You're going to observe some data. And you're going to have some actions available to you, and so there's this question of this. Probably, I sense what they're saying is there's this subtle interplay about what you know and what you can observe and what you can do that you have to combine to learn something. Well, and this articulates what you can learn. So, in terms of the average causal effect, that's this question is, you know, before it's it's the question between. Um, You know, you could you could ask what what the lawyer was saying in my toy example was that um, that this is not relevant. For example, right? Um, so actually, that was uh, I was going to follow up about that. Uh, so in in the uh, pearly, let, let me just, a, just the, I just have one half of a set is the finish. They're both averages. But anyway, go ahead. I am not, I'm not sure about that. So in the Perlian oh. framework, you like you supposedly have a, a real model of the way the world really works. You're talking about the Perl framework? Yes, you're assuming there are no hidden confounders, which is a, a kind of a big no-no for real world data. That's the assumption that you have no hidden confounders, so you really know um, how the world works. And um, 
no, there, okay, there could be, I mean, so we're getting deeper into the weeds than we've talked about here, but um, the issue is, I, I, okay, let me stay at a high level. I, I think the issue is not what you, is, like this, what I gave you is what I call the God's eye view. Now you don't, you're never gonna have the God's eye view, right? I think that's what you're saying. I don't think that either of them claims to have the God's eye view. Either of these frameworks claims to have the God's eye view. But they're saying, if you have the God's idea, this is what you would do. And then you're going to make some assumptions to narrow it. And at least you're articulating the assumptions you're making for the conclusion. So that you might say, like, let me assume this is the proposition for you. Right? And then, so then I can see what my conclusion is. But someone else might say, well, I don't agree with your assumption. You know, that, that's just, it's kind of like more modeling. You know, all it, models have some exact some assumptions, and at least if we articulate them, we can talk about what they are. So, so an example of the hidden confounders, like the do calculus, I think you referred to with Pearl, there are cases where there's unobserved variables, and then you have to make a statement about which are very, you know, which variables kind of account for that, which is the blocking and all that stuff in the do calculus. Well, there's um unhidden confounders. But there's a, there's a, there's, he's just uh, stating under what assumptions you can say what. Right, but in the Rubin model, so I'm just curious because I was actually thinking of applying it to something. Um, how do you know that, uh, like that the people who ended up, like it's basically observational. So uh, how do you know that the people who ended up receiving the treatment or whatnot were uh, selected randomly uh, and that you can use them as a basis for counterfactual reasoning. Right, but that's what I mean. That's like, that's the, um, well, I, I, it sounds like we need a longer um, okay. discussion, but I, I think this is, that reduces to the question of things of like, what do you mean by a random sample? Like, and that's an argument about assumptions. Right, you're gonna make some. So the question is like, there's two questions. What are the appropriate assumptions from a scientific problem? And then there's the like, given that framework, what are the mathemat? There's the mathematics, like axioms versus deductions. It's I I I mean I'm saying that I know that sounds trivial, and I don't mean to um, assume you're probably saying something else. But that's it's not clear to me what you're saying beyond that yet to me. There's. The, the, the problem might be just that you're on, in a, there's scientific situations where none of these assumptions seem appropriate that are needed. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. And then the, but, but then, but the argument, really have the, so then the broader it. argument is somehow we're doing this, right? Somehow well, the we're Ruben using, case, somehow my they, they might be wrong, but they, but we're doing it like some explanation for our reasoning ability seems to be causal. And uh, that's about things we don't observe, right? I mean, I, I've never seen what happens if I, if I, you know, I'm going on a mountain road and I just veer off the road. You know, I just, I, I don't need to experience that to know I shouldn't do that somehow, that, something that, like that. That's right? where, that's where somehow modeling, we're able to do that without the observing. The modeling aspect comes in. Our brain is able to model things and that, that fills in for those missing probabilities. It's right. Uh, this is anyway, a fascinating, yeah. fascinating yeah. discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Alyssa, we, we, I, I probably misunderstood your question, and um, and I might not even be the expert you need, but um, <laughs> but I, but um, um, but I, but 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 this literature br is, is it brings up these fascinating issues that I recognize, I guess, in terms of what you're saying. And, yeah. and, and maybe we should have at some point another event on explainability or interpretable, interpretability right. of machine learning and bias and sort of the more philosophical aspects. I mean, I think it's it's the right time to yeah. to have exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a good, a good example of this, you know, one of, one of the reasons I got interested in this was that I also do um, some consulting work that's outside of my academic work and it's like healthcare. That is very much what's happening right now. I mean, like like the example, Hinton's example, or the example I gave, it's just, we can predict if a patient is high risk and then tell the hospital, watch out for this patient. But yeah. that's very different than observing that me telling the hospital that the patient is high risk 
is useful. Like for example, an obvious example is the doctors know the patients who are very sick or high risk. They already know that. Like it's only useful if some patient they don't realize is high sick, high risk is high risk, right? Then in that case, the causal effect of telling them that the patient is high risk is gonna be there. Um, so you, right away, you see the same things emerging like in lots of places, you know, um, and it has to do with actions. I think we are a little over time, but I think it was a fa fan, really fascinating and uh, fantastic topic. At this point, I think I would like to wrap it up. Uh, and But this should not be the end of the discussion. I, I mean, I think it's really, really a lot of um, food for thought. And again, I think with, with, with the sort of rapid development that we've seen in, in machine learning, artificial intelligence, it's its really, these are the right questions to ask, in particular, sort of, if it comes, I think, to the ethical aspects. Yeah, um, if you guys are interested, there's, there's, there's a lot of people thought about it very deeply, and very active area, and I think some of these thoughts are being raised that it's the time for it. Um, you know, so lots of people are making these observations. Uh, I'm kind of a follower. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. All right. I think a great uh, round of virtual applause for, for Han again. I think he was really <laughs> sending us off with a lot of things to think about. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for all the questions and ideas. And uh, this, this, you know, this is really the idea that this is a, a place where we can sort of exchange thoughts. Um, have a great end of the day. Have a great weekend. And again, I hope that this discussion this is not the, the end of the discussion, but this is sort of the beginning of many more discussions. <laughs>